too long. All right, so once again, welcome back. This is the course on um, <clears throat> bioethical issues at the beginning of human life within the Master of Science in Bioethics at St. Thomas University. Always begin with a little prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. O Lord, send forth your spirit and we shall be recreated and you shall renew the face of the earth. Amen. Amen. And speaking of the spirit, uh, tomorrow is uh, Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost in the Catholic Church and many other Christian churches also. So uh, it closes the Easter season and begins what we call ordinary time, second part of ordinary time. Uh, which means to order our lives according to the teachings of our Lord. Hopefully, the Holy Spirit will help us do that, which we received at baptism. All right, so we're going to invoke the Holy Spirit to help us uh, work this out. Bioethics, mm, in the big picture, is a what we call an, an emerging discipline. is um, It's a very contemporary um, field of um, in, in human knowledge. And you can see it's a combination of biology and ethics. So it's really a uh, multidisciplinary field that needs the background both on biology and uh, on ethics. And it also needs to have uh, a bit of uh, medical background, clinical background, because many of the issues come up in, in uh, healthcare um, in the practice of medicine. So today, bioethics has two big pillars, if you will, or two big areas. So one is all the human life issues at the beginning of life, at the end of life, in healthcare, precisely, and then also the environmental issues, all right? So those are the two big um, fields in bioethics today, and this program is designed to address all those in various courses. This one is focusing on the beginning of human life, right? And so one key question for the beginning of human life is when does life begin? Because then that determines a lot of what we may or may not do with human embryos and then going forward after birth. But at least at the beginning of human life, we need to establish when does life begin. So that's the biological part. And the good thing about the biological part of bioethics is that it grounds us in a reality that is independent of us, of our, uh, of course, every opinion is respected, but uh, not every opinion is correct, right? We're all entitled to an opinion, but not every opinion is correct. For example, I can say that uh, what a beautiful orange sky, right? Well, yes, but the sky is not orange right now, right here. <laughs> it may be at sunset or another time, but not right here, right now, the orange is not sky. So you can say very well to me, professor, with all due respect, the sky is not orange right here, right now, unless by orange, I mean blue. <laughs> right? But the convention is that that color is blue and not orange. All right, so biology helps us to ground the ethical analysis, which is based on fact, on fact, which is independent of opinion. Mm -hmm. And so we need to form our opinions, we need to inform our opinion, and then we can speak with competence. That's the whole thing, because many people talk and you hear people talking about all kinds of issues all the time, but we know that not everyone has the competence uh, to talk on, on these issues, no? And therefore the purpose and the reason for this program and the course, et cetera. So it's always a two-step with each one of the issues. It's a two-step thing. First, we establish the biology and also the clinical aspect. If beyond biology, if there's something clinical that we'll see today with in vitro fertilization, there's a lot of clinical stuff in there. You know, that has to do with technology and the application of, of very sophisticated technology. And then we base our ethical analysis on that, on these facts. So we're establishing the first couple of lectures really was focusing on when does life begin in general, and then specifically human life, because organically we're not uh, separate from the rest of, uh, of nature, all right? Naturally, biologically, we're part of nature. Sarah, hello, welcome. Uh, Ariana, this is Sarah. Sarah, Ariana. Ariana is a new student for this uh, 
course. Mm -hmm. Uh, and with Michael there in another master's program, in a master in cell biology by Dr. Plunkett. All right, so again, to establish some basics here on the biological aspect of uh, <clears throat> this first couple of lectures, some key words that are concepts, very important concepts, uh, because they represent a lot. They have a lot of meaning. They're, 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 they have substance, okay? Genome, genome. So the genome is the whole DNA sequence of a particular species, hmm? of any species. And so the genome can be subdivided into coding region and non-coding region. So the coding region we call the genotype, and thus would be the 10 to 20,000 genes, for example, in the human species, right? The human species, the coding region is between 10 to 20,000 genes. Okay, I just went all the way down to the bottom line here. <laughs> Let me go through the middle in the meantime. So the genotype is the coding region. What does the coding region code for? Protein. They code for proteins, right? And we start with first individual amino acids, and then the link of amino acids will form a polypeptide, which is a short sequence of amino acids, dozens of amino acids. And then when we put po more polypeptides together, eventually we end up with a protein structure, which would be a subunit of what we call the quaternary structure, which is the actual protein complex that is functional, right? And typical protein complexes are made up of several protein subunits. But at that point, we're already at the 3D conformation for that protein to function, to, to uh, be functional. And remember that proteins, what do proteins do in metabolism, in nature, in the body of any, of any organism? Basically, they do the work, everything. They do almost everything, but they do the work, right? We have functional proteins and we also have structural proteins. For example, enzymes are proteins, all digestion and all that, right? So metabolism, we're defining life as metabolism either building up anabolism or breaking down catabolism, right? So the genotype is what the one that codes. So that's really the, the, the meat of the genome is the genotype, at least as far as the genetic code is concerned, the inheritance, right? Now, we know that the base pairs, uh, three consecutive base pairs make, or three consecutive bases, right? With their complementary pair, they make up what we call a triplet or a codon, C-O-D-O-N, a codon, and that codes for one amino acid. There are 20 amino acids in nature, and when we do the math of four bases uh, cubed because they're coming in triplets, then we get 64, and that's the redundancy. So 64 codons code for 20 amino acids. Therefore, there's more than one codon for each amino acid normally, except for the start, codon or the start amino acid. Anyone remember what is the start amino acid on A any proteins again? What is it? AUG on the codon on, on the um, RNA side, right? And on the amino acid, remember? You just said it. Oh, methionine. Methionine, MET, right? Methionine. So really when we look at any DNA sequence, uh, any protein sequence, so DNA can be sequenced and proteins can also be sequenced, right? Uh, when we come to a methionine, typically that represents the beginning of, of a new polypeptide. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's also known as the start codon or the start amino acid. Then there are three stop codons because at some point uh, we have to stop reading <laughs> the triplets, right? And the machinery falls off and those are called stop codons and there are three of them, et cetera. So I go into this luxury of detail just to emphasize that in the DNA sequence is the genetic inheritance, is the inheritance of the next individual of whatever species. I mean, this goes all the way from bacteria to the human, which is the most sophisticated species on earth so far, <laughs> all right? And every other fungus, plant, animal in between, right? And therefore, this code is what we call the universal code. Nature is very economic. If nature comes up with something that works through natural selection, it keeps it. It doesn't reinvent it because we're done. We have the car has typically four tires and a motor and a seat and a steering wheel. Let's go with it. You know, we keep making more cars of different types. 
but now we're not going to invent a new car with five wheels and two motors and eight steering wheels, <laughs> right? It's useless because the car that is now works. So let's keep just making it better, right? So that it turns out that uh, at least in the human, in the human, the coding region is in the human genome is only about three percent. Now. I really don't have any idea of what is what percentage is coding region is genotype in other species, but my intuition, what's your intuition? About the same. It's about the same. It's about the same, right? It's about the same. In other words, there's a lot of junk DNA, 97% of the human genome, of those two meters of, uh, of DNA in each cell, 97% of that is, we used to call it junk, meaning, doesn't code. In other words, it doesn't have triplets. It's a nonsense code. It doesn't make sense for uh, uh, for an amino acid, for any amino acid, all right? It doesn't have codons. And so what is the purpose of that? We really don't know, but more and more what's coming up is that that other 97%, which by the way, it's not just the first 3% and then the other 97%, you know? The, the 3% is interspersed within the entire genome, with the entire two meters, it's not that the first uh, millimeter is the coding region and the other is jump. No, it's all interspersed within the entire two meters, all right? And uh, we think that the rest of the DNA, the solar 97% has to do at least with the folding, with the compaction, with the supercoiling, right? So it's involved in compacting the DNA, the chromatin, precisely into the nucleus. So that process of folding, that's what we call the higher order structure of DNA, the high order, all right? Which is that folding upon folding upon folding uh, till you get something that is super, super compact, the 10,000 fold uh, thing. Uh, also in the, in the uh, joint DNA and the non-coding DNA, there are segments that are viral segments, for example, viral fractions. And that again, makes sense when we put it in evolutionary time that over millennia, what has happened to the human species, like any other species out there? Well, they become infected with viruses, right? And the particular mechanism of the virus is that they inject, they have to inject their DNA or RNA. What are RNA viruses? They're called retroviruses, right? And for example, influenza viruses are retroviruses, like for example, the uh, flu, and COVID, right? Uh, COVID-19 is, uh, these are retroviruses and means that it's RNA instead of DNA what's inserted into the whole cell because a virus is very simple little structure. It's basically either DNA or RNA crunched up with a capsule, yes, a protein capsule. So it's similar to a crystal, it's more similar to a crystal than it is to an actual living organism, the virus. And they're tiny also, because keep in mind, you know, again, for by way of um, size, right? So uh, I just use this common example. If you look at the back of your hand, we look at the back of our hand, what's the smallest we see? Well, we see tissue. <laughs> we see the epidermis, which is the outer, part of the integumentary system, right? So we see tissue, we cannot see individual epidermal cells, but they have to be there because together they form the tissue, all right? So already cells are microscopic. Now the nucleus of each cell is more microscopic, right? Because each microscopic cell has a nucleus inside. And each nucleus has inside the entire genome, the entire six uh, feet uh, of DNA, so that's super, super microscopic, okay? Now bacteria, there are thousands of bacteria that can fit in each cell. And there are thousands of um, viruses that can fit inside one bacterium, or maybe even millions. <laughs> so the magnitude is super, super tiny. It's measured in, in the area of nanometers or even Armstrong units. So uh, the virus is an obligate parasite because it doesn't have a replication machinery. It doesn't do the two main functions of being alive. What are the two main requirements for being alive? Organically speaking. Water. Metabolism, to metabolize, right? Oh, they're talking about ingesting. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Uh, physically and oh. reproduction. 
to yeah. metabolism reproduction to for any organism. We, we're walking around the forest today and we see a creature. We see something that's walking <laughs> or crawling, all right? Is it an organism? Is it a living organism? Well, if it's metabolizing and has the capacity for reproduction, then it's a living organism, right? And so again, you see evidence-based, <laughs> evidence-based. Uh, so why this? Oh, yes. So you notice viruses by themselves, they cannot do either one. They can't. They can't metabolize and they can't uh, reproduce by themselves. There's no space literally inside the viral capsule to do any of that. So they necessarily have to sequester. They have to infect a, a host cell to sequester, to kidnap the replication machinery of the host cell. All right. And when that happens, Part of the process is that the viral DNA or RNA gets integrated into the host DNA. And so the replication machinery, when it's replicating the host DNA, doesn't know, bless you, that it's also replicating viral DNA. And it will do that thousands of times or hundreds of thousands of times. And then the viral DNA code codes for its protein, not the host protein, but the viral DNA protein capsule, which will be made then with the ribosomes of the whole cell. So these guys are totally nasty. They are kidnappers 100% of the whole metabolism process of the cell. They take it over, but they allow the cell to do its own thing too because they don't want to fool the cell to continue living and doing its own thing. They don't kill the cell that way. They kill the cell when that viral DNA gets encapsulated into the viral capsule that was made by the host to the tune of thousands or hundreds of thousands to the point that they can't fit in there anymore and they explode the cell. They lice the cell, the whole cell. And then each one of those viruses goes to a new cell. So you can see the ramping up is geometric, is very it's exponential, <laughs> all right? And that's why an infection, there's the incubation period. We don't feel it for, for um, and that's the, the R value. Remember back when we're trying to determine R value. So what was the R value for COVID? This goes back two and a half years ago, almost three years ago, to figure out what was herd immunity. What was the percentage for herd immunity? Again, it's experimentally based. So for each infection, for each viral infection, there is a particular R value, which means how many people get infected by one person, one infected person on average during the infective time. Now the infective time happens to be before there may be any symptoms, which in, in uh, influenza type viruses is anywhere from three to five, three to seven days, let's say it's kind of the window, you know, average about four to five days. I'm infected, but I don't know it because I'm asymptomatic. <laughs> in the meantime, I'm talking to people and sneezing and coughing on top of people. So everybody else is getting infected around me. And they don't know it either because they're also asymptomatic. And then three days later, I start coughing and sneezing myself and running a fever. And now I have to call all the people that I was with for the past three days or seven days because potentially I infected all those. That's the infective rate, infectivity, right? And that's how they figure. They figure that by the time that 70% of the population gets infected, then the virus no longer progresses because likely uh, a new infection will not go anywhere because the person I'm talking to has already been infected <laughs> and is already immune to some point because they're still living. Otherwise, if they weren't immune to it, then they're dead, all right? And so you see how that whole thing works out. Anyway, back to virus and why? Oh yeah, so over time, these viral sequences have been inserted into the human genome and to any other species genome. Imagine for us who have all kinds of healthcare, well, recently in human history, we have begun to wash our hands, et cetera. Uh, and you soap, but the rest of nature is just walking around on top of each other, right? And, and licking the ground and everything else. And so you can imagine if we have about 10% viral sequence in, in us, my intuition is that other species have even a larger percentage of uh, viral sequences in their genome. And that is just hanging around in there. Now, uh, oh, by the way, another just came to me. I have here, uh, where's that uh, stuff? Oh yeah, viral sequences. So and this, et cetera, you can also put oncogenes and proto-oncogenes, genes that may code for cancer, 
but are silenced, are shut down by all kinds of complex mechanisms. But if they express, they may express cancer. <laughs> all right. So some cancers are inheritable also because they're part in that other uh, DNA uh, sequence in the non coding region. So that's another example. Anyway, so you see that really the genome is more and more complex and sophisticated than we thought of original just coding, non coding. The non coding may have other functions that are also useful. Just let me finish this thought back to viral DNA that 10% approximately. Um, clinicians now are thinking, immunologists are thinking that, that those viral fragments that we have actually has a positive uh, thing now because since they're fragments and actually code for the entire virus or the caps or anything like that, okay, which is a good thing. We don't keep getting reinfected by ancient viruses. Uh, but also the double goodness is that it may actually stimulate the immune system for the immune system to stay up to date and be kind of on alert if another sequence is similar to a viral sequence, to a fragment of viral sequence that we have in our genome, well, our immune system has already developed antibodies to that viral sequence in anticipation, all right? So these uh, fragmented viral sequences to the DNA may actually be beneficial to maintain what we call a healthy immune system, a healthy immune system. Arani had a question? Yeah. So if the viral DNA gets inserted into the intrans or non coding region, does it still get um, transcribed into a like, viral viral body? It may in principle. So Arana is talking about introns. We go back to that 3%, and even that 3% is not wholly, totally. So the 3% actually includes what we call introns and exons, all right? And so it's the exons that actually produce the, the polypeptide sequence. And the introns are like spacing in between. You can think of it of uh, you have a word, you have several words, and you have space in between the words, right? So the words themselves are the coding region. And then the space in between is keeping that coding, those uh, coding regions together as a polypeptide, as a particular polypeptide. So it depends if the, if the viral sequence gets inserted into an intron or an exon, it can actually damage that sequence, mm -hmm. right? And it can cause harm depending on where it inserts, whether that particular protein or enzyme, whatever, how functional is it, how vital it is, you can get down to the point of destroying entire coding sequences for polypeptides, and they don't have much effect because there are other enzymes or proteins that can substitute, or they're extra copies, right? Or that's on one extreme, whereas the, the mutation or the viral sequence uh, um, insult is not, it's iniquitous, it doesn't have much uh, effect. The opposite would be by changing a single base or a single base pair, actually, it can actually throw off the frame downstream. Like if I have a word, you know, uh, let's think of a single word, uh, cat, C-A-T, right? But say I put an H in between the C and the A, what do I make? Now I make chat, which is not cat, the cat is not a chat, all right? Or if I put a P, uh, uh, capet, that is a nonsense, right? And so a single insertion or deletion of a single base in a critical region could actually destroy an entire protein, which could be vital for a metabolic process, all right? That's the extreme of a point mutation that can be vital. And I think, uh, is it cystic fibrosis or multiple sclerosis? I think one of those two are actually is a point mutation and it's inheritable. So we have uh, things that are there. You know, normally with those mutations that are so lethal, natural selection takes care of it. In other words, the individual with the mutation will not survive and therefore will not be passed on, or at least they won't survive to reproductive uh, age, right? And they will not pass on the mutation. So, uh, <clears throat> all right. Uh, so any questions on this stuff? Um, again, I tend to talk too much, but the bottom line about the biology of the genome is that the genome contains the genetic material of inheritance of whatever species, biologically, and that's not an opinion. That's a biological fact that is in this room and outside these walls <laughs> around the earth. 
right? Now, based on that, we know that that genome gets transmitted to zygote at fertilization, or technically, actually, to the egg, to the ovum, right, at fertilization through the process of uh, fusion of gametes or syngamy, which completes the fertilization process. So let me go to that other one a moment. Michael, Kendall, any questions? Anytime, jump in, okay? Okay, where's the other one? Here, what's the other one? What happened? Went away? Realization. Oh, I closed it instead of making it bigger. There. Okay, let me do that. Now, we're still on biology of the thing, right? Fertilization, biologically speaking. So diploidy is restored. That has a lot of meaning. That's a crunch, all right? And diploidy means that two gametes have come together, which are haploid, and meaning by each, each haploid gamete, right? Does that mean that it has half of the genome? For example, an ovum, in the case of the human, or any species that reproduces sexually, an ovum and a sperm, they're haploid, right? So they don't have pairs, they don't have chromosome pairs, they have single number of chromosomes. Does that mean that they have half the genome? How many say half the genome for each gamete? How many say the full genome for each gamete? I mean, I'm not sure. What was the question? Okay. The gametes, all right? We can think of the case of human because we're talking about human, but it applies to anyone that's reproducing sexually. All right. So the gametes, egg and sperm, they're haploid, right? So it means they have unpaired chromosomes, right? Okay. Now, does that mean that they have half the genome? In other words, a human egg, a human ovum, has half the genome, the human genome, and a human sperm has half the genome so that when they fuse, now we have 100% genome? Yes? No? Unsure? Don't care. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, no, each one has a full genome, but it's not duplicated. It's uncopied, it's single, it's haploid, all right? But the 23 chromosomes is the full mm -hmm. genome, right? It's not, seven, it's not uh, 24, 17, it's not 16 and a half chromosomes. <laughs> it's 23 chromosomes, which is the full genome. It's, there's no copy. In other words, there's no backup. And that's why I say that gametes or whatever species are really delicate. <laughs> They're delicate because there's no backup. I mean, I'm talking delicate, with regards to mutations, to UV or other insults, chemical or high heat, which are the three main ones that can really damage DNA, All right? Again, UV, especially UVC, which is the most penetrating, uh, high heat or chemicals hmm, that can uh, damage the DNA, cause mutation. And therefore you notice that these two types of gametes are either super protected or the alternative where they're not super protected and they have to go out into the environment, in other words, out of the organism, out of the male, then they are come out in, ex, in an exuberant abundance. <laughs> and this is why I'm saying, consider this, the eggs, where are they? They are in the most inner part of the body that you can get, the ovaries, you know, in the hip area, right in there, they're protected by bones underneath, the, the, the hip, the cancer muscles, etc. So really they're very much in the inside of the body to protect those ova from any kind of insult, right? The alternative, so that's on the female, on the male, since those two have to fuse the egg and sperm, then one has to travel to the other. <laughs> they're not gonna drop travel. It happens also that in other species, they both travel and fuse externally. So there'll be sexual reproduction, fusion of gametes, but external fertilization. What sort of some examples of external fertilization? It's all over the place. Think of fish, amphibians, right? The fish, the female lays the eggs on the bottom of the lake or the pond or the ocean. And then the male lays out the sperm, which is called smelt. And those sperm have to wiggle around and fertilize the eggs but it's external fertilization, sexual reproduction by external fertilization. 
Now you go forward or higher and more complicated uh, vertebrates, specifically the other three groups, right? Not fish, not amphibians. Then what do we got? The land animals, the land tetrapods, reptiles, birds, mammals. Those three groups, they have internal fertilization, but they don't all have internal gestation. So fertilization is one thing, gestation, pregnancy is a different story. So of the three land uh, vertebrates, right? Reptiles, birds, mammals, uh, which ones have external gestation? No gestation, actually no pregnancy. Reptile mm -hmm. eggs, mm -hmm. right? Our cell phone close, the embryo is self-enclosed, there's no placenta, <laughs> and birds the same. The egg is self-enclosed, uh, I mean, the, the embryo, all right? In another type of egg, which is not an ovum, is a shelled egg. But in mammals, there is internal fertilization, there is sexual reproduction, there's internal fertilization and internal gestation. And therefore the number of offspring, the number of individuals of progeny generally is smaller number because there's more effort and there's only so many that can fit inside a womb, et cetera, inside a, a uterus, but there's less danger of getting eaten, squashed or, uh, or destroyed otherwise by nature <laughs> because it's inside the body of the female, literally, right? And so it's a maximum protection that nature has figured out to give to the progeny. And therefore the expectation is that more progeny will make it to birth, will survive, the gestation period and therefore fewer progenies in general, right? Okay, so um, anyway, at diploidy, uh, at fertilization, diploidy is restored. And that means that now this new reality, this new entity, which we call a zygote from way back from the Greek, linked or yoked together, right? Then is a new individual. Is a new individual of whatever species. Why should we be different? Because of our pretty faces? No, <laughs> because not everyone has a pretty face. <laughs> and therefore we're no different biologically than the rest of nature, right? We're mammals biologically, et cetera, et cetera. And so therefore human life begins at fertilization and the story. At completed fertilization, if you wanna, you know, there is a process there that takes a few hours and that's what we call syngamy when the, the, um, the level of, of um, linking is completed. And I say that there are three levels of linking, right? Or yoking or coming together. What are the three levels? Beginning with the two cells, what are the two cells? The gametes, the egg and sperm, they fuse. So literally sperm needs to empty out into, needs to pour its pronucleus into the egg, into the ovum. And there was a little video and so forth and it's all over the place on the internet. So that's the first level of, of uh, linking or fusing is at the cellular level. Then the second level is the two pronuclei, they're copronuclear because they're haploid, right? The two pronuclei also need to fuse into a single diploid nucleus. And then the third final linking is the chromosomes from the father and the mother to pair up so that mitosis may take place, the first mitotic division, right? Which happens within 24 hours of fertilization. So the first mitotic division, once we have that first mitotic division, Fertilization has been over for 24 hours. <laughs> and then from that point on, from that first mitotic division until the death of that organism, let's say in a human, an average of about 80 years, 81 for women, 78 for men, years, it's all mitosis, mitosis, mitosis for the rest of our lives until when? Except for the ovaries and the testicles, which primary cells are gonna undergo meiosis instead of mitosis for making the gametes that are needed for the next generation. So you see everything is uh, in its proper place, all right? Now, there are two special cases, even biologically, and it's important to address these special cases biologically because of the next layer that we're gonna put on here, which is a layer that is unique to the human, which is the human soul or the human spirit or the human conscience, et cetera, okay? And that, yes, we claim that that is unique as far as we can tell to the human. And they're very telling, very uh, 
physical things that we can see that point to the reality of the uniqueness of the human soul in the human species alone, all right? Now, and those two special cases are the twinning, monozygotic twinning, right? From one zygote, two or more zygotes, because the twinning can be two or four, typically would be a, an even number. Uh, <clears throat> and even more challenging than that, in a sense, is the twin reabsorption, right? Or vanishing twin. Uh, that was in the last lecture. So let's uh, just very briefly look at those. The basic thing, if you follow the process, if you follow the chronology, we start with one fertilized egg, which is now a zygote, which is one individual, right? And then within the first couple of weeks, more or less, the first couple of weeks uh, after fertilization, that individual can actually split into two. So now we got two individuals. You can think of it as a type of asexual reproduction, if you will, and maybe it's a vestigial sexual reproduction. We know that sexual reproduction also occurs a lot in other um, organisms, especially lower, what we call lower organisms, more uh, less complex organisms, all right? So it could be, and even for us, where mitosis is a type of asexual reproduction, right? It's happening all the time. So this twinning may be seen as a type of um, asexual reproduction, that is, let's say vestigial, that is still sticking around for millennia, even once we have progressed into uh, sexual reproduction, all right? But it's there in the background and every now and then it shows up an average of one every 64 pregnancies, uh, which is not really a very rare thing when you think about it. You know, one in a hundred, it would be even more rare. And that's 1%. Anyway, so that's how we get this new individual, right? So if one splits into two, for the purpose of the soul, let's say, uh, if there was one soul, then when the split happens, I'm getting ahead of myself, God is the creator of the soul, right? So God created a soul for the first individual zygote. And now this zygote, if you look at it as a type of asexual reproduction, the zygote has produced another zygote, or it could be at the moral stage or the blastocyst stage, or even the gastrolytic stage up to the fourth stage. Right, already after implantation, a week after implantation, it's amazing. Where there's bilaterality already. Anyway, the new individual comes out of the old individual, right? So the old individual stays with its soul. In the case of human, here his or her soul, and the new individual. What prevents God donating a new uh, soul if he donated the first soul to begin with, right? As long as there's a logical consistency, there's a new entity who is a new individual with its own genome, <laughs> which is, in the case of human, a human genome, right? Because again, we don't saltate, we don't jump from one species to another. This ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, which we saw in the, in the last course, to say it's not really um, true in the strict sense. We don't jump in our embryonic development we don't jump from fish to amphibian, to reptile, to bird, to mammal, all right? Even though the early stages of development are similar, more similar to the other. I mean, the most similar first, uh, the most similar stage of development is what? Among all species that reproduce sexually. What is the most similar stage of development of all species, all different species that reproduce sexually? There are thousands and thousands of different species that reproduce sexually, right? Including insects, et cetera. What is the most similar of all the embryonic stages? Is it the last stage? You know, no. a bird about to hatch a chick inside the egg is very similar to a baby about to be born? Not at all. The fusion of gametes. Yeah, well, the fusion of gametes, the actual zygote, the zygote, because you look at it on the microscope, it's just a ball. <laughs> it's a transparent, translucent ball. The zygote of any species is a ball. <laughs> it's a sphere. The only difference is gonna be what? The actual size of the ball, <laughs> from very, very tiny to less tiny, generally microscopic. I've never seen an actual cow egg, but some say that you can actually see a cow or an elephant egg with the naked eye. It's that big. <laughs> Of course, there's gonna be a little tiny dot, but you can actually see with the naked eye, a cow egg or one of these large mammals, <laughs> all right? And I assume that a whale egg can also be seen by the naked eye. It's still very, very tiny. I mean, that's huge. 
to be seen by a naked eye is unbelievable. Anyway, uh, so you get the picture, right? Now in the reabsorption, again, we can play it kind of backwards or we gotta go forward and then backwards. In other words, reabsorption implies that there was thinning prior, right? Because what's being reabsorbed? What's being reabsorbed is uh, another sibling, it's a sibling. Now that sibling could be a monozygotic sibling or it could be a dizygotic sibling, either one, but there's a sibling around who died. And now what do we have? We have a cadaver, we have tissue, we have corpse of some tissue, some cells. It could be a morula, it could be a blastocyst, it could be up to a gas prolapse. But it's basically tissue that is now dead, is necrotic, is beginning to decompose, right? So whatever is around, again, nature is economic. Oh, there's tissue right here. Hmm, nice, let's eat that tissue, <laughs> right? And it's gonna be the twin is gonna eat its dead twin, its cadaver, or it could be the endometrium gets to the twin before the other twin gets to the cadaver, all right? Or they can share it, I don't care. But whatever is gonna happen, that tissue, because nature's economic is gonna get reabsorbed <laughs> because it's very early on, et cetera, et cetera. And everything is kosher because it's under certain conditions, but uh, that's basically what happened. We have now a dead twin. Well, dead twin, uh, the soul has left. <laughs> Right? And just like any one of us who dies, well, the soul has left. Okay? And so you see that, again, there's an argument of logical consistency. We don't need to all of a sudden uh, appeal to magic or, uh, you know, hocus pocus or anything like that. Hmm? It's an argument of logical consistency. If a twin dies, uh, the twin dies. Now the other alternative, the third alternative, uh, or the other alternative is not to get reabsorbed, but to actually be discarded eventually. There is even, I don't know if you've ever heard of something called papyriform twin, papyriform twin. Papyriform is a reference to papyrus, to paper. And what happens if these twins, if one of the twins dies a little later on, once uh, the twin is already, they are either, uh, older embryos or fetuses. Remember that when when does the name cha change from embryo to fetus? After yeah, after week eight, after two months, from the ninth week forward, it's called fetus instead of uh, embryo. It's just a technicality. Fetus means in Latin uh, uh, tiny being, tiny being. All right, fetus. Anyway, uh, if we have an older embryo, like at eight week or even beyond third month or even fourth month or something like that. And one of the twins dies, but doesn't get reabsorbed, right? Because now there's too much organized tissue and so forth. Eventually that dead, that cadaver in there, which is very soft, right? Will start getting squeezed by the other uh, fetus who is growing normally, naturally, and is squeezing on this now dead a twin, dead sibling, and will squeeze him or her, in the case of a human, so much that it will literally squeeze out all its juices, all its water, all its fluids, and will just become a, a, like a sheet of paper. <laughs> and that's why it's called papyriform fetus. It's just like a flat, it's like a two-dimensional fetus, right? Definitely, obviously dead, very dead. And that may or may not be discarded before, during, or after birth of the live fetus, of the live twin, all right? A piriform is an extreme thing, but it does happen. So nature is very creative and uh, will make do in order to keep that pregnancy going. Um, right, where, where did it go? Is that? Oh yeah, okay, so I'm done with the fertilization. Now, philosophically, we're just adding layers here. Uh, at the philosophical level, I talked about form and function, uh, form and uh, form follows function. It's a dictum that you see in biology and uh, many places. Uh, uh, technology also uses that, like engineering. <laughs> a crane, right, has to have mechanical parts, etc. But by form, by form, you know, scientists actually mean shape because scientists, even though they have a PhD, which is philosophical doctor, they don't really know how to philosophize too well because they're more technicians than philosophers. They never went to seminary. They never went to, they had one or two courses in philosophy at the bachelor level, like intro to philosophy. What did you learn into to philosophy? Maybe do a little logic, 
and then you do biomedical ethics, right? Which is this stuff again. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, I'm just tongue in cheek here, but basically empirical scientists of which I've known quite a few in, in uh, seven decades, uh, don't really know how to philosophize very well because typically the typical answer of empirical scientists uh, when we try to philosophize is, well, that's your opinion and I have my own opinion and we each have our own opinion. But philosophy is not an opinion, it's a science. And it has, it's a science because it has a method, it has a discipline of, of thinking, right? Uh, but it's not empirical. So it's a metaphysical science, it's not a physical science. Anyway, the point is that really they need shape, the 3D structure of the thing, but for us, philosophically, form is different from shape. And we have to recognize that distinction, okay? So we understand shape, this thing has shape, et cetera. But the form is actually the substance, the essence. And now we're getting philosophical, which is not my opinion. <laughs> it's, it's everybody's opinion. It's a common opinion, right? And it's even built into the grammar uh, of any language. There is a noun, the substantive, and that is the substance of the thing. So one example is uh, right now, so there, uh, I don't know if Kenny ever went online or not, but there are, well, Elizabeth, you're, you're two, you're physically and virtually present. <laughs> 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 so how many shapes do you want to count for yourself? <laughs> the physical right. or the virtual? <laughs> let's say, let's keep it down to one shape, okay? And plus there's, uh, there's uh, Kendall and there's Michael, and there's two, four, five of us here. So we, how many shapes do we have in this lecture right now? The physical and the virtual, <laughs> seven. Some may have eight. <laughs> let's keep a simple. Let's say seven. There's uh, Kendall and Michael are virtual, and the rest of us five are here uh, physically, right? So there are seven shapes. Definitely seven shapes. I'm not your shape, and you're not my shape. Uh, there's only one human form in here. There's only one human form, right? There's only one form, which is human form, all right? Or human nature, want to call it. So. You see, philosophically, form makes a big difference, right? Because we're talking about the human zygote being of a human form, right? In addition to being a human shape. <laughs> so the shape is exactly what it's supposed to look like at that stage of development, mm -hmm. just like any other stage. A child doesn't look exactly like an adult already born, but a child looks exactly how a child is supposed to look at that stage of development the shape, but the form doesn't change. So shapes do change of each individual. We've changed our shape <laughs> quite a bit <laughs> from the time we were zygotes, <laughs> okay? But the form really doesn't change because we're human from beginning to end. And even beyond the natural end here on earth, which we call death, we continue to be. So now we have to make the other, the final jump into the theology of the thing, right? So philosophically, I think you're abundantly clear about uh, form and the human form is what gives consistency to the argument that life begins at fertilization, right? And then from that stage on, it's just development, further development, development, development. Even the newborn is not fully developed, right? Does that mean that the newborn is less human than an adult or a teenager or a very old person? No, they're just as human, right? But in an earlier stage of development, of development. Okay. So, uh, we can see where these arguments go when we need to talk about issues like uh, contraception, abortion, in vitro fertilization, three parent embryos, okay? Because all this is a lot driven by technology, but the basic biology is still there. The technology doesn't change our biology substantially. <laughs> Right, even though it may add or, or take off parts, etc., but the substance, the essence, remains as human. That's what makes us a species, biologically speaking. Mm -hmm. All right. So finally, uh, let's get into the theology of it. Right, and again, the argument of logical consistency. We need philosophy to do biology, uh, to do theology. So philosophy is the tool, if you will, the instrument that we use for doing theology. Just like we need a microscope to do microbiology. Mm -hmm. So in theology, <clears throat> and yes, this is Catholic theology, but it's not exclusively Catholic. In general, it applies to what we call the Judeo-Christian tradition. You know, 
which implies all of Christians, Catholics, Orthodox, and Protestants, for example, we're all Christian in that we follow Jesus Christ and his teaching, but also the Jewish tradition, which doesn't follow Jesus Christ and his teaching, right? And so the Judeo-Christian tradition, which can be summarized, if you will, in sacred scripture or the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament together. The Judeo-Christian tradition, we call what we call a unitary vision of the human person. Unitary, body and soul, one, all right, as a single unit. This is in stark contrast with other philosophies and theologies and mysticisms that are not Judeo-Christian. Can anyone think of an example? Typically, the most obvious example, there are at least a couple of them. How about Hinduism? How about Buddhism? How about Shintoism, which is for the Japanese, or ancestor worship, which is for the Chinese, right? All these philosophies, theologies, religions are non-unitarian. And so the next alternative is that they are dualistic. In fact, in Chinese and in general for Asia, there's a symbol that represents that a lot. Right, the yin yang, you've seen the yin yang, right? When I say yin yang, it's two drops, like two teardrops intermingling. All right, so that's showing uh, the duality, the interaction between these two. That kind of mentality uh, over the centuries has also filtered into the Judeo Christian tradition in different <clears throat> errors, theological errors. For example, to think that uh, good and evil are still fighting it out, all right? <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> that one is a very, very common error because, I mean, <clears throat> if we're honest with ourselves, right? And I made the point that we all have a conscience uh, because, and one example that we have a conscience is that uh, <clears throat> we would be embarrassed or ashamed to do certain things in public, at least in public. <laughs> Uh, because of our conscience. Otherwise, if we didn't have a conscience, you know, the rest of animals are walking around naked and they couldn't care less. <laughs> mm -hmm. But we do. And so that is just pointing at the fact that there's something within that is telling us that's a no-no, all right? So well, that's a conscience, that's an ethical conscience. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not appealing to any particular religion and so forth <clears throat> or philosophical principles. So, so that's pretty universal. Now, <clears throat> the... Um, I lost the thought. The, uh, the, 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 what was I before? Uh, the conscience. Oh, yeah. So the dualistic. Yeah. That good and evil is still fighting it out. Because in our conscience, we do have to decide on a daily basis, you know, between good and evil. <laughs> uh, because between robbing a bank or not robbing a bank, because between speeding or not speeding. <laughs> All right. And so we need to make these ethical decisions. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we would think that good and evil are still fighting it out, <laughs> right? And they will be fighting it out forever or until the end of time. <clears throat> but no, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, good and evil are no longer fighting it out, okay? Good has won. <laughs> and that is not just a Christian tradition, it's the Judeo-Christian tradition. In other words, for the Jews, it's monotheism, and that monotheism, that God, that believe in one God is a good God. It's a benevolent God. It's also a God that, for, that uh, exacts justice and so forth, but does not exact justice unfairly. God is not forever the God of the Jews, let alone the, the God of the Christians. The God of the Jews is not eternally fighting against evil, against Satan. That God has won, and Satan is a creature of God. <laughs> All right? And so you see... Good and evil are not really fighting it out. Good has already won. What's the problem? The problem is that we're late. We're retarded. We don't catch up. You know, we're lazy. We're late. And for Christianity specifically, we're 2,000 years late. Because when Jesus was claimed, everyone should have converted to the message and to the messenger. <laughs> All right? But we didn't. And so we're late. We're catching up. And because we're late, now we have to deal with good and evil. <laughs> hmm? But in the bigger picture of God's creation, I'm, I'm talking theologically, good has already won because God is, and God is good. God is love. God is not the devil. 
if God and evil had not won, then God and the devil would be two gods and they'd be fighting it out and it would no longer be monotheism. Then we have two gods, a good God and a bad God. And what was the case of that? Precisely, many other religions, including the Greeks and the Romans, which were superb civilizations, but theologically, they were superbly confused because they were polytheistic. And you had good gods and bad gods and goddesses in classical Greek, the Greek mythology, which is extremely rich, but totally passionate and irrational. So irrational that Greek gods fell in love with human women, which were gorgeous or not, according to their taste, and had sex with them. And these human women had babies. And they're called what? The heroes. So Ulysses and uh, the other one, um, Hercules, all those are the Greek heroes. And that tradition has continued to this day in our culture, in our pop culture, what's our heroes? Well, Batman and Superman and Batwoman and all these gorgeous bodies that look human, the best of humans, but they can also fly and do things that are extraordinary. They can pick up an entire train and throw it over the horizon, <laughs> right? It's the same thing as the Greeks, but in our contemporary language. And it sells a lot. And it's built up multi-billion dollar kingdoms <laughs> on that fantasy. <laughs> but it's truly a fantasy. I'm a real hero today that can do that stuff. No, real heroes are very different, right? So you see, <clears throat> there's a mixture into mythology. But the problem when we go away from the one body, one soul, from the unitary vision, then we become dualistic, at least dualistic, or trilistic, or quadrilistic, and then that allows for all kinds of vibrations. Like, for example, the body and the soul are not really together. They're just kind of glued together temporarily with some scotch tape. But when the soul, when the body, and typically, you know, then when we have that kind of dualism, who's going to be the good guy in the, in the picture? The soul is going to be the good guy, and the body is going to be the bad, the bad guys, meaning that stuff material is bad. And the spiritual is what's good. And those are the dualistic philosophies and theologies of Hinduism and Buddhism. Why do Buddhists go into a mountain and try to seclude themselves from reality and go into transcendental meditation to disconnect from the physical reality? Because the physical reality is material, is mundane, is bad. It doesn't elevate me. It sinks me down into the earth and into the grave. And so the body is bad and the soul is good which is an error, <laughs> it's an error with all due respect. But that also allows, that separation allows for reincarnation because when my body dies, well, my soul will jump into an elephant or a palm tree or a giraffe or whatever and keep going and jump from one species to another, which really doesn't make any logical sense, okay? And so a lot of respect for this, but really from our argument of logical consistency, sorry, it doesn't cut rigor philosophical thinking, all right? So the alternative is the unitary vision of the human person, <clears throat> body and soul one, then we have to deal with death because death is a real thing that happens. And it seems like there is a separation and there is a separation between body and soul because the soul doesn't go into the grave, right? <clears throat> so how do we deal with that separation? Well, it is a separation, but it's a temporary separation because part of our belief, and that's why I said, that conversion should have happened 2000 years ago is that the second coming of Christ, what we call the second coming of Christ in glory to judge the living and the dead, as we say in the creed, which is not just a Catholic creed that we profess every Sunday, but it's also the Christian creed. Many other Christian denominations have the creed, the credo as their belief. I believe in one God and then Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, et cetera. And you can go into a Methodist church or Episcopalian church or Baptist church and look up their creed and it's the same as our creed, <laughs> which is, well, there was first an apostle creed, which was summarized, and then the Nicene creed got extended and so forth. But basically, substantially, it's the same belief. One God in three divine persons. Uh, and then that the second person is the one who incarnated and died, rose from the dead return to the Father and will come again in glory, in glory, right? To judge the living and the dead. So judge the living and the dead means that it's the end of time and place, like the same theater curtains. The, the show is over, right? The show, what show? This universe, it's over because if you collapse time and place, you have no longer space for the universe. So not just earth and not just the solar system, our solar system or our galaxy of the Milky Way, the whole kitten caboodle 
of the three and a half, 3.7 billion years of expansion that we have in the universe. That would collapse somehow, <laughs> don't ask me how, God is God. So it's, we are going into belief here. We're going into belief, but this belief is not like fantasy. It makes sense. You know, if the soul, we have that longing, there's a little phrase from Augustine, St. Augustine, that we say, our hearts are restless until they rest in you, O Lord. And really, of all the relationships we know, as much as they fulfill our hearts and so forth, there's always some space in the heart that is not totally fully filled by any other individual. Even married couples have, who have been very in love and very in love with, their, with each other for forever, well, forever here on earth, okay? Therefore, there's this reality of the beyond, of something more. And that would be at the end of time when God, as God, will put it all back together <laughs> about him soul, but into what we call the glorified body. So this glorified body is very interesting and very intriguing because I can't really picture, I could only talk about it hypothetically and theologically that first of all, um, <clears throat> We don't, um, there's no sex. There's no sex. Well, there's, we remain as male or female because that was established at fertilization. So that's part of our genome. It's part of our essence, all right? Maleness or femaleness. And that continues, but it continues into this glorified body. So we continue with our masculinity or femininity, but there's no intercourse. There's no sexual activity. And why is there more sexual activity? Because the same that we don't have any more sex in heaven or hell. Um, we don't eat either and we don't sleep either. In other words, there's no metabolism. There's no metabolism going on. <laughs> so you see, it's definitely a metaphysical reality, but there's no metabolism going on. That's why we don't need to eat or sleep or anything like that, but we are real. And in fact, we can say we are a bigger, better reality than what we are right now, because right now we are in this physical body that is fragmented and is due to disease. It's prone to disease and illness and temptation and everything else. But on the other side, all that is done and done with, and there is the union of body and soul. Now, I know that I'm going into belief here, but at some point, theology has to make the jump and the leap into belief. And what I say by this is that we, in the Christian tradition, even have two examples, not just one, but even two examples of two glorified bodies, <laughs> okay? And what happens to be male and the other one happens to be female, so we have one of each. And we call them Jesus and Mary. Now, of course, this is doctrine of faith. This is dogma of faith. So it involves faith, right? Which is also a grace and a gift, but it's a belief. And it's a belief that is not inconsistent with an argument of logical consistency until we get, uh, as long as we maintain body and soul one, then we can project it into eternity in that way, all right? But there is that temporal separation of, death that we have to deal with and so we deal it we bury the dead right until the second coming <laughs> now you tell me anyone know any other species that buries their dead because they seem not to care <laughs> they seem not to have you know an intuition about eternal life so why should they bury the dead they die, they walk, the living keep walking or, or running or swimming or whatever they're doing, right? So burying the dead and we find graves in the book, this is a little bit of what I covered last <laughs> semester at the other course on fundamental principles, but uh, <clears throat> these graves, first of all, a couple of things about the graves, which are human graves. Uh, we find them in the most primitive cultures that have been discovered, right? And also we typically find they're clothed, they're not, they're not buried naked. You know, why not save on the clothing? I mean, it took effort to make that clothing, right? To sew, to stitch together the mammoth uh, skin or whatever it was that they did. First they had to cure the hide and all that and then stitch it together. So why waste it in the grave? I'm gonna take this guy's suit with me. Is that corpse suit, right? No, the dead the, 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 the are buried clothed. And on top of that, they even put food in there too. So, I mean, all that points in an argument, a logical consistent that there's some kind of belief in the afterlife. And these are the most primitive people that barely had a language, painted stuff on the walls. You know, they didn't have 
microscopes or technology or rockets or anything like that, the most primitive cultures. And so it's pointing to some reality that goes beyond. The, the the physical here on earth that all in all ends from the grave, right? Okay, I'm expanding a lot. Believe me, I'm gonna get into today's lecture. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so bottom line to address some of the concerns from before, when we talk about, you know, we can talk about, well, part of my soul has left me or uh, has been ripped out because my ex, boyfriend left me or my ex-girlfriend took a piece of my soul with them. Well, that's figure of speech, right? They didn't do that literally. They didn't really go in with a knife and took out a piece of the liver or whatever it is where the soul was or a piece of the brain, <laughs> okay? So it's a figure of speech. It's metaphorical language. But really a soul, no one can take our soul away. The only one can take our soul away is the devil, <laughs> is Satan, all right? And that's by tempting us because even the devil, strictly speaking, cannot take our soul away. Uh, the, the devil would tempt us, but the devil cannot make us fall into the temptation. We'll tempt and we'll tempt all the time. But the will, the human will is the one who decides yes or no. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me stop and ask any questions or comments. There were some questions or comments from previous lectures and especially the one I didn't give in person. No. Why is he doing that? I don't know. Okay, uh, from chat, I don't see any chats. So, Kendall or Michael, you okay? I haven't asserted yet. Okay. All right. They said yes, they're good. Yeah, all right. <laughs> So does this clarify some stuff, I hope? Yeah? <laughs> okay. All right, so we start applying, you see how this becomes relevant. We start talking about the sticky issues of beginning of human life, right? Like the one, the first one, the first bomb was abortion. To this day, I mean, in the United States, I was legalized in 73. I was studying biology at FIU. I was just graduating with a BS in biology in 73, okay? Yes, I'm ancient, that was 50 years ago. <laughs> 50 years ago, graduated with a BS in biology at FIU, State University, went to MDC first, South Campus, back then was South Campus, it was two campuses, and it was Miami, Miami Dade Junior College. And the maximum you can get from Miami Dade Junior College was an AA or an AAS. It was a two year junior college, and it was a feeder for FIU, which became the new State University here in Miami. When we started FIU, uh, the whole campus was one building. BC, Primera Casa, the one building, five stories, and the rest was just grass. I remember I was living in Sweetwater across 8th Street there in a little apartment. I would take my bicycle across the wooden bridge, which is still there, has been redone, to do, 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 do over the wooden bridge, and into the field through the paths of, uh, of grass. And I'd see the lizards and the snakes running around, get to PC, Primera Casa. And that was uh, FIU. Today it's got more than 50,000 students and the whole place looks like a city, like a mini Manhattan. You know, they spilled over into Sweetwater. They've taken over Sweetwater with uh, skyscrapers almost. I mean, 20, 30 stories, high buildings, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, all that in one lifetime. I wasn't even thinking about the priest or anything like that. Uh, I just wanted to be a marine biologist. <laughs> My plan that day, with that time, when I got my bachelor's in biology, was scuba dive in the morning, sail in the afternoon, and party at night. That was the plan. <laughs> okay, not unlike many young plans today. <laughs> many people's young, many young people's plan. Uh, but God is a wicked sense of humor, and He did what He did. So I eventually incorporated biology into bioethics because then the bioethical issues started coming up. All right, and uh, fast forward to today. And my point about why that was what? What the point was? Oh yeah, so abortion, 73, the bombshell, abortion overnight. Abortion becomes legal in the entire 50 states of the US. And it blew me away because everything had been learned, learning in two secular, very, very secular humanistic institutions like MDC and FIU, all of a sudden, 
was thrown out the window and became, you know, the law of the land that a woman could kill her unborn with impunity, legally. I said, wow, I didn't realize the level of ignorance of this population. They must not know about human embryology. They must not know about syngamy and the human genome and all this stuff. <laughs> How can it be? There's something wrong with this picture. So I started becoming pro-life back then, not even going to mass on a regular basis, not even thinking about the priesthood, just as, well, these people need to be informed. We need to talk about human fertilization and, <laughs> and the gametes and haploid and diploid and restoring diploidy and all this. So strictly on the biological basis of it, because what was at stake was a human life, a human being, a human person, which is the unborn. And of course, the care is always for both, right? They say, oh, you people, you pro-life people, you only care about the unborn, you couldn't care less about the mother. Well, if we don't care less about the mother, then that's gonna kill the, the unborn, right? So we have to care about the mother to keep the unborn alive for two births. So we certainly care about the mother a lot. Basically, we're trying to say, please don't kill your child. <laughs> you know, there are alternatives. So that was last week's lecture, all right? There are alternatives and there are healthy alternatives. And believe me, after hearing many dozens and dozens and dozens of confessions in, in almost 40 years of the priesthood, you will feel much better with yourself if you don't kill your child, all right? Trust me on that. Trust me, trust me, trust me, because sooner or later, every pregnant woman knows sooner or later that that is or was a human being. You know, sooner or later. That's the reality. I mean, that's, you just can't walk around all of life like this, okay? Anyway, so much for that. Let's go forward. Questions or comments about last week's lecture? No, all right. Okay, so everybody has an opinion. And now you see it 50 years later, 50 years later, finally, we got a Supreme Court because you and I have been living this in the past couple of years. Finally, we got a Supreme Court that was honest enough to say it's not in the Constitution. Legal abortion is not in the Constitution, the US Constitution. It's just not there. The unborn is not mentioned. Scalia, before he died, you know, said this all the time. Folks, the unborn is not just mentioned in the Constitution. So we cannot put a right to, to privacy on top of something that doesn't exist in the Constitution, you know. So therefore, it's not that the Supreme Court, yeah, the Supreme Court reversed Roe v. Wade decision, right? Which according to last lecture, you should know about it already. Uh, that was a 73 decision, but it doesn't make abortion illegal. It just sends it back, it reverts it back to the states where it belonged. And that's where it was. And in fact, before 73, was abortion illegal in all 50 states? How many say yes? Before 1973, was abortion illegal in all 50 states of the United I States? I believe it was not. Yes? No? Not sure? <laughs> okay. No, it was not illegal. It was legal in New York. It was legal in California. It was illegal in Alabama. It was illegal in Florida. And in some states, it was legal until X weeks or X months, and then illegal going forward after the third month, after the third trimester, after mm. the heartbeat, until the kid says hello through the, through the uterus, you know, whatever. But it was legal in some states, it was illegal in other states, and it was some, at some stage of development illegal in other states. So each state really decides, each state decides, right? And that's what it was before 73. And that's what the US Constitution really protects, <laughs> that each state should decide. There are also state constitutions. States also have their constitution. And in some state constitution, abortion has been put into the constitution as legal or illegal, et cetera, et cetera. All right? And in other it's not. So you see, that's really what uh, the Dobbs, the OBBS decision, Right, which is the counterpart of Roe v. Wade. The Dobbs decision was to revert it back to the states. And that's what it, and that's the big firebomb that exploded last uh, year after almost 50 years. In the meantime, real people were killed to the tune of about 60 million. So the US population today has 60 million human beings less 
And some people say, well, that's a good thing because otherwise we'd be overpopulated. No, we won't be overpopulated. Europe has 10 times more population than, than the US and they're not overpopulated, okay? So anyways, this legalization of abortion, that decision of Roe v. Wade 50 years ago, wiped out 60 million human beings from the US. And that's the reality. So now we gotta deal with that, okay? And now you see states jostling for what's gonna be what in each state. And then people will make decisions according to that. Yeah, but uh, in the meantime, we're trying to present an argument of logical consistency for, uh, we have to be consistent. You know, if we say that born life is precious, then unborn life is also precious. And by the way, when we get to the course on end of life uh, in a few weeks, we have to make that same argument for the elderly, just because they're in a vegetative state or they're senile or they're demented, doesn't mean that we kill them, right? There has to be still care for the human, you know, until the end. Now, in vitro fertilization, in vitro fertilization. Okay, we're gonna look at IVF and we're gonna look also at uh, artificial insemination, artificial insemination, which is not in vitro and it has a different ethical evaluation. You'll see why. So, ready? First, the biology. Again, the same old diagram of uh, fertilization, right? In the ampulla of the fallopian tube, the horn of the tube, when it bends toward the ovary, that's where fertilization occurs normally. And then that little uh, zygote starts traveling down the tube. Okay, now, of course, this diagram is exaggerated. The size is exaggerated for the purpose of illustration. If this were drawn to scale, we wouldn't see the zygote, we wouldn't see the egg because it would be microscopic. And this tube would not be that large by any stretch of the imagination. You know, this would be a super abnormal tube and egg. This would be like a giant uh, thing going through the tube, which is not the case, all right? This all has to be scaled down to size. So they're doing the illustration for, for the purpose of, of uh, pedagogy, of showing what's going on. And also, the tubes inside and the organs inside and even, even the endometrium, the, the uterus, is not just like a cylinder or a cone, right, that is empty in the middle. No, no, that's all. First of all, the normal, the normal um, mm, uterus internally, right, if we were to be inside a uterus microscopic and looking around, all right, we wouldn't see like a cone or something like that with flesh around it. No, it would be more closer to like a, two pancakes. <laughs> We're inside in the middle of two pancakes. In other words, there's the top fold, if you will, of the uterus and the bottom fold of the uterus. And that's how they are. So when you see these diagrams of um, representations of the uteri, you see it looks like a triangle, but really the two walls are kind of uh, fairly touching each other, right? There's not a lot of empty space in there. So there's no falling literally like the, the video, you get the impression that when the morula uh, at this stage blastocyst comes into uterus, it kind of falls on a precipice you know, over the edge of a building. Ah! And then somebody catch me down there. <laughs> it's for the purpose of illustration, okay? These things, first of all, what's all the internal track uh, of the female reproductive system is lined up with what? Mucus, the cervical mucus, right? So all this is lined up with mucus, so it's sticky for sure. And there, this, this embryo is being guided along the way so that he or she doesn't fall out. Plus at the very bottom, there's also a door, right? A gate, which is the cervix, which is a circular muscle, a smooth circular muscle, which typically gets a plug Yes, with uh, with uh, with the mucus, so that it, it, the whole system makes sure that that embryo is not allowed to to come out. All right, uh, for the normal nine month of uh, pregnancy, it's called the surgical the cervical plug. All right, so implantation happens within five to seven days, but at this point, it's already the blastocyst. And I uh, want to also mention that. Uh, you know, in pro-life, pro-life, trying to uh, uphold and sustain the life of the unborn, as well as the born, including the mother and so forth, and the, the father, by the way, also 
has to be brought into the picture, okay, very much, because it's easy to fertilize, but it's hard to then uh, to support the pregnancy and the child, et cetera, et cetera. So, mm, uh, yes, in pro-life, Many times we talk about the unborn and, and uh, zygo, the blastocyst, the moral, et cetera. I have heard many speeches on pro-life and even writings on pro-life and so forth that talk about it is human. Well, what's the problem with that kind of language from a pro-life perspective? The embryo is human. Yes, the blastocyst, it is human. What is it? It's a reference to the embryo, to the human embryo. But the human embryo, that's the one thing that a human embryo can never be, and it. Because we said that from fertilization, that human embryo is either boy or girl, it's either male or female. So it's he or she. But the language, the language, there's something called um, uh, wordsmithing, you know, and politicians do wordsmithing a lot to spin the message, to make connections where they may or may not be. But when we talk about the unborn from the zygote forward as it, what are we doing? At least subconsciously, we are depersonalizing. We are objectivizing. We're making the embryo a thing because this is a pen. It is a pen. It is a whatever, notebook. It is a paper, you know, but it's our things, objects are it. Humans are either him or her. You know, uh, I don't talk, I don't say my brother, uh, it is my brother. No, he is my brother. <laughs> okay. And so one very easy way to depersonalize the embryo is to call the embryo the human unborn and the it. And I see it all the time in the language, even in pro-life people. All right. And so we have to be careful with that because the whole effort is really to personalize the embryo to give them what they're due. You know, in fairness and justice, if they're human, then they need to be personalized, right? To refer as him or her. We may not know the sex, and now with sonogram and all that, they know the sex, and they take all the fun out of it, but uh, basically it's one of the two, <laughs> okay? Now, so this is uh, what happens in in vitro. The word in vitro is at all reference to glass, in glass, in other words, in older times, in the lab, all the labware was made out of glass. The petri dishes were glass, the pipettes were glass, you know, uh, all the equipment, the paraphernalia was glass, which typically pyrex or corex, meaning that it could be autoclaved, it could be um, sterilized and reused, right? Even syringes. Well, all that is out the window now. You can see them in museums because they're antiquities, but all now is plastic and it's disposable and they come in containers that are sterile and so forth. So we don't have to worry about, uh, uh, we autoclave for different reasons, but we don't have to sterilize the equipment and reuse it and so forth. Uh, so now we should really call this in vitro, we should call it in plastic or fertilization because it's all plastic, all right? But anyway, the in vitro stock and it's there, so it's historical, but it's you see IVF, you don't see IPF. Anyway, it does occur in the lab. And so there's a manufacturing process that is occurring here. Here's one extreme example of in vitro fertilization, which you can see the height of technology going on, right? What's this round thing here? Yeah. That's a human egg, that's an ovum but it's the cumulus. In other words, it's the ovum even with the layers of protection. In other words, the zona pellucida, which is here, and the corona radiata, which is here. See the corona radiata? These are other uh, layers of cells that are protecting the egg, okay? And you can even see what's down here. One of the polar bodies. <laughs> this is a polar body, all right? So, this is intracytoplasmic sperm injection, otherwise known as ICSI or ICSI. They call this ICSI for short. It sounds cute, ICSI, right? So this is the egg. Imagine the size of this. This is about 10 microns, right, across. So 
This is a needle, it's a glass needle. How do you make a glass needle that is one, you know, that can go inside an egg? <laughs> well, this is how you make a glass needle. I used to do this, I can, if I you, when I was studying biology in my bachelor's 50 years ago, you take, you take a glass rod that is hollow, you know, one of the glass rods that's hollow, all right? And on the Bunsen burner, you heat it up until it turns red hot, the glass turns red hot, and then you pull fast. And when you pull fast, then the rod breaks in the middle, all right? But as it breaks, that, uh, that glass melts, right? When it's red hot, the glass is melted, and it tapers, and it tapers down to a microscopic tip, all right? And I love doing that because while well, I was working with Aplesia, which is a uh, seek slug, I was inserting these needles into their nervous system to measure the actual potential and so forth. That's a different story. But anyway, it was fun because once I made the needle, actually I got two needles out of each little glass rod, right? And I could follow with my eye, I can follow the glass rod. Physically, I can see the glass rod and I, I would, maybe I put a black background on, on the back something black or something to make contrast, right? And I could follow the glass rod tapering down, tapering down, tapering down. At some point, I couldn't see the rod anymore, but I could still touch the tip, but I couldn't see it because it was down to a microscopic level. <laughs> and it was fun because I could actually touch it, barely, you know, but, uh, but I couldn't see it anymore. And uh, that's the tip of this glass rod. So that's how they're made. The important thing about that is that it keeps its hollowness. So you can put a single cell through there. And what's a single cell that is being put in here? This is a intracytoplasmic sperm injection. This is a fertilization. This is in vitro fertilization. This is the ultimate manipulation of in vitro fertilization, of IVF fertilization, okay? What's being inserted here obviously is a sperm. And here it is. Here's the sperm. You can barely see it, but there is the head of the sperm and the tail is kind of curved like that. The sperm is right here, okay? And it's gonna be injected into the egg. <laughs> so you get just one sperm? Yeah, because what do you want in there? You want 46, right? Chromosomes, you don't want 23 plus 23 plus 23, okay? Because that would be a gross abnormality. That would call for Three arms, three legs, one and a half heads, you know, two, one and a half livers, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, one sperm to one egg. This is fertilization. It's just being done artificially. So you understand this whole part of the diagram or the photo, this is a photograph. This is a micrograph, a microscopic photograph, all right? What's the last thing that needs to be described here, which will again, emphasize the level of technology that is being used, the sophisticated level. No one has asked me, Professor, what is this thing here? What is this big, huge bulge? <laughs> this thing here is the tip of a vacuum. All right, so think of a vacuum cleaner at home. You pick up a tennis ball with a vacuum, right? Mm -hmm. a vacuum side, you can pick up a tennis ball. That's essentially what this is doing functionally is this thing. This is a tube that is hollow and the tip is blunt because it's going to hold the tennis ball is gonna hold the egg in place. Otherwise, the egg is gonna slip around. How do you get that needle into the egg? You know, yeah. you try to puncture the, the egg and the egg is slipping around all over the place because all this is a neutral medium, it's in, it's in fluid, right? So try to puncture an egg with a needle that is all in a fluid and the egg is going to be escaping. And so the egg has to be held in place. <laughs> and, and you can see here, in fact, that it's, it's see how it's, kinking in a little bit, right? Now imagine the level of sophistication of suction on this machine to hold the egg in place without dropping it and without sucking it in. Imagine the level of sophistication and hold it there long enough to do the procedure, which may take a few seconds, a few minutes. We don't know, all right? So that's pretty sophisticated, right? And that's why these fertilization cost tens of thousands of dollars, 20, 30, 40, $50,000 per attempt. Now, not every fertilization in vitro is, of course, ICSI, right? 
The simplest one is you just get the eggs for the woman and you toss in the sperm from the man, donor, whatever, and then you allow the sperm to fertilize the eggs on their own, all right? And then you take well, out what the- What percentage device. do we know in the IVF clinics? What percentage is like that, ICSI versus just, like you said, kind of tossing them in there? Yeah, ICSI is typically, what's the uh, so function? I always tell my students, think functionally, think functionally. What would justify ICSI? Because of course, it's much more sophisticated technique, which involves more personnel at the tune of $1,000 an hour, whatever they're earning, you know? And so, um, I would think there what would justify more. that? The obvious case is, well, yeah, but that's kind of banal, no? Uh, something a little more substantial would be sperm incompetence. Either the the husband or the donor, well, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't qualify as a donor, you know, because they need competent sperm to donate. But let's say the husband has uh, sperm incompetence. It could be either the flagellum is missing or the flagellum is weak, you know, or the shape is an abnormal shape and so forth. There are a number of morphological or physiological things that can happen with sperm or it's low count, low sperm count. All of these conditions could qualify for some sophisticated technique like it, okay? All right, so this is the equipment that is used, for example, and uh, you can see again here this, uh, a microscope is super sophisticated. First of all, the objectives are underneath or the bottom so that the top of the stage is clear for staging, for doing stuff, all right? So the objectives are underneath. Also, excuse me, as you can see, there's a camera that projects the image and magnifies it. See the same old uh, vacuum there, uh, blunt vacuum holding the, in this case, what is this? This is actually a morula, exactly. And the cumulus is still with it. This is a morula, all right? And uh, they have targeted something here. There's a little cross hair down here. So they're doing some kind of procedure. It could be that for the morula, they're trying to pluck out one blastomere for uh, doing genetic manipulation, for doing uh, pre-implantation diagnosis. They'll pull out a single blastomere, which for some reason, doesn't destroy the morula. The morula can continue to progress into a normal pregnancy in the human and non-human. This was originally done in frogs. <laughs> anyway, uh, you see that these are the micro manipulators. That are, imagine how, uh, how little the stage needs to move, right? To micro manipulate this <laughs> nanometers. All right, all that is done electronically in a sterile chamber, because this of course is exposed to the air and so forth. And the technician is watching a screen and playing with some joystick that is moving the whole microscope for focusing, for moving the stage, for moving the micro manipulators, whatever they're doing on this thing, etc. So pretty sophisticated and that's why IVF is so expensive. That's part of it. The other part is just markup. All right, so let's go through the process of IVF. Again, we're on the biology of it. And the process is, they're not just gonna extract one egg, right? They're gonna, they want a dozen eggs or how many eggs in a hyper ovulation. So they're gonna stimulate the woman to hyper ovulate. That's the first thing that's done. That's done with fertility drugs like Clomid or some other analog, right? So they give the woman uh, fertility drugs first, that's the beginning of the treatment so that the ovary will um, mature any number of follicles, except, so normally it's one follicle per cycle, right? One follicle per month on average, and they may or may not alternate from one ovary to the next, but the normal um, ovulation is one follicle matures, ruptures, and the little egg will then go up to the ampulla and wait there for 24 hours to see if there's fertilization or not. All right, so that's the natural process. And here's a photograph of a normal human ovary. Here's a hyperovulated ovary. <laughs> okay, it should be obvious that this is an extremely dangerous condition. It may be a dozen or two dozen follicles that are about to erupt. <laughs> okay, when, when I see this, the first thing that comes to mind is pain, <laughs> all right? <laughs> 
and I'm not even a woman. So, <laughs> so uh, from what I've heard, it can be painful, just one uh, ovulation. So anyway, that's what happens. Now, if these rupture, if you can see this area is what? Well, <laughs> it's in the back. This area is highly vascularized. That's why it looks so fleshy colored. You know, at the microscopic level, it's full of capillaries, right? Therefore, if this ruptures, that means massive hemorrhage. ER, and let's hope she makes it because she may bleed to death in the process. All right, so it's extremely painful and extremely dangerous. And still people do it, thousands and thousands of people doing it right now as we're talking because they want the baby, right? They want the baby. Okay, so hyperovulation is the very first, which is uh, extremely dangerous, extremely painful. Yeah, of course, they're gonna give analgesics to the woman and so forth, uh, so tone down the pain. But again, it's more chemicals, it's more manipulation. Then they need to extract these eggs, right? So they go in with a needle. Yes, transvaginally, large bore needle to suck out the eggs individually, right? Yes, it's all guided by ultrasound because that needle should not go beyond the ovary to suck out the eggs individually very carefully because if the needle goes through the ovary or through another part of the system, we're back to the hemorrhage, all right? So that's how those eggs are taken out. Let's assume that it was a dozen eggs that were taken out, extracted. Now they're put into a Petri dish and fertilized in a Petri dish. Uh, I can use the first one. I hear there's a class coming through. There's a uh, group of students coming by, potential students. So this one here, yeah. In a few minutes, we may get an interruption by a family getting a tour over there, potential students. Okay, so they put them in a Petri dish or sometimes it's a flask. Anyway, there's neutral medium that mimics the internal environment of the endometrium of the uh, uterus or actually the, uh, the fallopian tube. Okay, and once they have the eggs there, then the simple case is just to uh, deposit the sperm inside, once the sperm has been washed from semen, they deposit the sperm inside the neutral medium and let the sperm fertilize whatever egg have fertilization. Once fertilization occurs, we can go back here. Now we start with the different stages of embryonic development. Look at this guy. Isn't that a neat photo? What do you see there? What is this? Before, these are actually two, two pronuclei. Right. They're beginning syngamy. <laughs> this is an egg that has been fertilized. These are two pronuclei beginning to fuse. What are these three little guys? Polar the three polar bodies. <laughs> and here's a corona radiata and the zona pellucida. So it's still the cumulus is still intact, right? It's holding on. Right? Remember the, the hatching? Remember the hatching? <laughs> okay. Yes. Even mammals hatch. <laughs> Mammal embryos. All right. So here's the first cleavage, two cell stage, mitosis within day one, within 24 hours, first mitosis, two cell stage, four cell stage, we're at the moral stage now, eight, 16, etc. Now blastocyst, right? See the blastocyst, third stage. But the blastocyst is the first time that we have two different types of cells, two different types of tissues. What are the two different types of tissues? The outer layer, which is called a trophoblast. Not yet, not yet, you had the gastrula. This is blastocyst before implantation. It's still a ball, and it's still pretty much the size of the egg itself, right? It's, it's another compaction is another use of the term compaction. The cells are smaller inside. You see, every time there's a subdivision, the cytoplasm gets divided into two. So you get a geometric progression of cells, but still within the same overall size because each new cell 
a pair is smaller. Half the daughter cells are half the size of the original mother cell, right? And the original mother, mother, mother cell of them all, the great grandmother cell, it was a zygote, right? Okay, so anyway, the blastocyst, now you have two cell layers because the morula at some point starts hollowing out on the inside. And there's a little mass of cells that develops on the inside which is the inner mass of cells. So very unimaginatively is called the ICM, inner cell mass, there it is. And then the outer layer, they use a little more imagination. They call it a trophoblast, trophoblast because it's the outer layer, all right? And these are two different types of cells of the same species, of course, of the same human, but what becomes the embryo proper is the ICM. And that's why the stem cells come from there, the embryonic stem cells. So the ICM is what becomes the embryo proper. And the trophoblast becomes, yes, because the trophoblast is what is in contact with the endometrium. So really the tissue to tissue contact is endometrium, the inner lining of the endometrium and the trophoblast. So that's what's gonna develop the placenta, which is that organ that is very vascularized be between the embryo and, and, the, uh, and the uterus, <clears throat> all right? So three to five days, so five days, we know that it's the blastocyst that needs to implant, right? So a zygote will not implant, a morula will not implant because the zygote doesn't have a trophoblast. The morula doesn't have a trophoblast. And so it needs the trophoblast to implant. And it's actually at the level of tissue, it is the trophoblast that convinces the endometrium, hey, I'm a friend, I'm not a foe, don't discard me, don't destroy me by an immune reaction, don't throw me out, <laughs> okay? Don't abort me, I'm friend, not foe. And that happens biochemically between the trophoblast and the inner lining of the endometrium. Mm -hmm. So, uh, oh, there is something, about, oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> Go back, this thing go back, there. So you see, first session at day one, right? But then blastocyst at day five through seven, and it's the blastocyst that implants. Therefore, this early embryo for the first three stages has to be kept in an incubator. In other words, it has to mimic the internal temperature and conditions of the fallopian tube and the uterus, right? So that's an incubator, which is basically an oven, very sophisticated oven, all right? The temperature has to be maintained steadily at what? Right, centigrade, which is body temperature, Fahrenheit, thermometer, 97.8, right? Fever above 98, 99 is fever. Fahrenheit, okay, so that's body temperature, internal body temperature. And also this tray has to swivel gently to keep the nutrient medium moving around so that the whole uh, blastocysts are bathed, right? And, um, and uh, in a, in a uh, proper condition, you can see it's all computerized, digitalized, very sophisticated equipment a few more thousand dollars there. It's got a double door, it's got a glass door. One can see through, you can open the outside door and see through the glass, making sure that everything's okay, nothing has exploded in there, et cetera, et cetera. So heavy technology, uh, sophisticated technology, okay? All right, so after five days, what happens? Well, we better get that blastocyst inside a womb, otherwise he or she is not going to grow into a baby, right? So. Here is the mother, she comes back and uh, now ready for implantation. Attempted implantation. So a cannula is used, a cannula is just a tube that is inserted transvaginally again, all the way up to the womb. And then one or more embryos are released. The magic number is four. No one really knows why, but on average, when four uh, blastocysts are introduced or inserted, typically one takes, one actually implants. What happens to the other three? The other three on average are discarded, are discarded, right? Or discarded mean that they come right out after the cannula is uh, extracted, 
either immediately or sometime later, they come out or they die inside, but that's the ratio. So what's the real ratio of success on average? 25%, right? One out of four on average. Now, these other three, I'm just gonna leave it there for now. When we get to the ethical analysis, we see what that means, that success is 25% on average. This is an actual micro photograph, is a sonogram that you can see. And here is, they're calling it micro drop, notice, micro drop with, I did not label this, this was labeled already. What does it say? Micro drop with embryos, right? So this has at least two, typically four, <laughs> which is the average uh, success rate. All right. How would you prepare the uterus or Right. So keep in mind this woman, if she is the same odor of the eggs that she hyperovulated, right? Well, at hyperovulation, what happens to the rest of the body or the rest of the uh, um, <clears throat> of the reproductive tract of the woman? The rest of the reproductive tract is preparing for fertilization and therefore preparing for implantation. So at the same time, let's go back to the natural scenario. The natural scenario, when a woman ovulates just normally one egg, simultaneously because of the hormones, estrogen and the um, follicle releasing hormone and so forth, the FHAs and everything, that is also affecting the inner lining of the uterus doing what? It is thickening the inner lining of the uterus in preparation for implantation. So it's a simultaneous, both things happen simultaneously at every ovulation. A follicle releases an egg that is mature, ready for fertilization over at the ampulla. And simultaneously, the walls, the endometrium, which is the inner lining of the uterus, thickens, becomes spongy in preparation for possible fertilization and therefore implantation. So already the uterus is predisposed by the hyperovulation process. So then the future fertilization process must be done very quickly after like the end of such Yeah, a five to seven, seven days later. Six. Yeah, five to seven days later. In other words, you know, again, think functionally. These guys are all alive. So you cannot postpone the implantation unless there's cryopreservation. We can get to cryopreservation, but that's, we're talking about the live embryo. The live embryo continues, you know, we cannot tell embryo, okay, hold it on day two there for a few weeks until we get the mom back. No, no, it's gotta be done five to seven days. Actually, the window I think is three to five days because they, they anticipate it so that the embryo, the blastocyst is not passed. So they actually anticipate. And because again, you start getting the picture that this is a shotgun industry. In other words, there goes the quail. Now shoot the shotgun and hopefully one of the pellets will hit one of the quails. It's a shotgun industry. In other words, that's why they're inserting three or four because an average one in plants, all right? It's not, the sophistication is at the level of technology but not at the level of implanting a single one. Okay, uh, right. So we said that for the purpose of illustration, a dozen eggs were extracted from this particular woman, this hyperovulation, a dozen, right? So the dozen eggs are fertilized right away because they're fresh, but how many were inserted? Five, five days later. How many were inserted of the dozen eggs that were fertilized and incubated? Inserted. How many were inserted? Four. On average, four. So how many are left? Eight. In the incubator are eight blastocysts, eight human blastocysts, eight siblings are left in the incubator. Can you leave them? Can we leave them in the incubator? No, because they're going to continue to grow and they're going to become more or less, and they don't have any, at that point, they don't have a placenta, they don't have a nutrition, it's going to get crazy in there, right? And so what's the, what, what do we do with the eight embryos, the eight spare embryos? We freeze them. We freeze them and that's cryopreservation. This is cryopreservation. It's just sophisticated language for uh, the process. We do cryopreservation in the lab all the time upstairs. And so 
liquid nitrogen. Where's nitrogen right now? In this room and in our lungs, <laughs> right? Remember, it's about three fourths of air that we breathe is nitrogen. The atomic nitrogen, N2, gas, just like oxygen is the atomic oxygen, O2, but oxygen is only 16% more or less of the air that we're breathing. Most of the air that we're breathing is nitrogen. And so are we to freak out about gas nitrogen that we're breathing air? No, because it's what we call inert. It's an inert gas. It's just coming in and out of the lungs and it doesn't happen. Nothing happens. Thanks be to God. The lungs don't absorb it. It just comes in and out. And that's it. Oxygen gets picked up, the hemoglobin, et cetera, et cetera. So, but it's a gas. When we compress gases, we can liquefy them. We can liquefy them either with low in the temperature or compressing them, right? And so uh, what happens when we put water in, uh, when we put liquid water in the freezer? It freezes because we lower the temperature. We could do the same with uh, pressure is just that it takes an incredible amount of pressure to basically liquid water is incompressible. So it's a bad example. Uh, but anyway, we can change the state of matter by altering the pressure or the temperature, right? Uh, liquid nitrogen or say nitrogen is liquefied in companies, in factories that make liquid nitrogen. You can buy it in the supermarket, you can buy liquid nitrogen. The average temperature of liquid nitrogen is about minus 180 degrees centigrade, minus 180, which is about minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? Minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Is that cold? No, that's not cold. That's very cold. That's extremely cold. <laughs> Anything you put into liquid nitrogen is gonna freeze instantly. It basically crystallizes, all right? But you can't know the difference. So if I put, my finger into liquid nitrogen, it crystallizes. But I can't, though it looks exactly like that finger, but if I go like that, it pulverizes, <laughs> okay? If I tweak it, it just pulverizes. You can go online and see the rose that is dipped into liquid nitrogen, it looks exactly like a rose, but then the guy comes like that and it pulverizes into, into the air. So that's liquid nitrogen. And that's where the cryopreserved embryos are put. So they're preserved, they're cryopreserved, all right? Essentially, they're crystallized. And so what happens in crystallization? There is no metabolism. You have just arrested their life, their metabolism. So they are in what we call suspended animation. <laughs> are they dead or alive? I may say they're alive. I may say they're dead. I'm sure. Okay, they're alive. Why are they alive? When a bear hibernates, is the bear dead or alive? Dead, alive, alive, alive. You don't want to find out in person. Because <laughs> when that bear wakes up, that bear is going to be very hungry after several months of not eating, several months of not eating this large bear, okay? but they're alive. They're just in suspended animation. The metabolism has been slowed down to so much that they're not even moving. Okay, the metabolism is slowed down, almost shut down in hibernation. In this case, totally shut down. <laughs> so the molecules are all there, but they're just waiting to thaw out. And we know that they're alive because when they're thawed, some actually survive the thawing process and can be implanted. And nine months later, there's a baby coming out. And so it's not that they were dead and came back to life because we only know about one who was dead and came back to life. And that happened 2000 years ago, okay? So they can be dead in there and then come back to life. Organically, it doesn't happen, all right? Dead is dead. So they're alive, but they're in suspended animation. This has ethical implications, as you'll see when we get to it. All right, so these are the tanks. You can go online and see, uh, of course, these are the tanks. The nitrogen, as you can see, is little by little escapes, right? Because the liquid vaporizes and little by little vapor at the molecular level escapes. 
And so, in fact, every time they go in and out of the tank, which is frequently because it's not my embryos that are in there, you know, it's a dozen customers that have their embryos in this tank and then another dozen customers in this other tank. So there are hundreds of customers and they all have their embryos in those tanks and you better keep the labels correct <laughs> or otherwise. And there have been all kinds of problems. All kinds of problems means that every now and then you see in the news, one of these things, of course they have backup systems. It's very important to maintain the cold temperature here. It's very important to fill the liquid nitrogen on the tanks on a scheduled basis, because this, every time you open that tank, again, that nitrogen vaporizes and the vapor evaporates. The vapor goes out into the ambient air of the room, et cetera, et cetera. So they have to be refilled periodically with, here are the tanks of nitrogen to refill these guys, you know, and keep them at the proper level and so forth. So a lot of maintenance goes in there. What happens on the weekend? Well, it's gotta be a weekend crew, et cetera. It's been in the news about a year ago, it was in the news. It hit, I saw it on the BBC online, international, right? One of these clinics over the weekend for somehow they lost power, electrical power. Yes, you got it. Everything thought out, everything. The room and the tanks, they thought out. When they went back on Monday morning, everything was mush. Dozens and dozens and dozens of right. human embryos, mush for dozens of their clients. The class action suit was mega millions of dollars, right? Not two weeks later, this was, I think it was New York or something like that. Not two weeks later, totally unrelated company, the same issue in California. Unbelievable. Don't they, don't they have like major backup generators you would think? Yes, but how much redundancy do you want? Right. They will say, well, one redundant, by the way, that brings another, issue. This is one of the least regulated industries. Well, in, and 11,000 anyway. to $15,000 to freeze an embryo with storage costs of 400 to $600 a year. So what a business. Exactly. Per embryo, per couple, et cetera, et cetera. You multiply per clinic. So in Miami, I know at least, I know at least of two clinics and I'm sure there are more. Okay. Of course. Of yeah, yeah. The human there's going to be human factors. There's technological factors. All right, but you know. So uh, I mean, they take their chances. And the couples, in spite of knowing that they may know it, they may not know it. I don't think that couples get this kind of lecture when they yeah. go into the process. They say, "Oh, you want baby? We can do baby for you, right? How many do you want? What sex do you want? <laughs> okay. So yeah, this is the background. This is the real background. These are the photographs. And so there's technological factors, there's human factors involved, mm, and we need to move forward. All right, so the cryopreserved liquid nitrogen for end times. Let's say that, so we did the first attempt implantation of four, one implanted, and then the other three did not implant. So now the couple has their baby in the best case scenario, married couple, could have babies on their own. Now they have, uh, going forward on the pregnancy, no, no, before birth. Going forward in the pregnancy, now she's one month pregnant, two months pregnant, third month, she loses the pregnancy for any number of reasons. She loses the pregnancy, all right? No problem, go back to the in vitro clinic, there are four that are cryopreserved, there, there, I'm sorry, there are eight in the tank, right? So go into the tank, pull out four more, let's do a second attempt, it's only gonna be $40,000 more, but you got the money, so let's do a second attempt, you want the baby, Let's do it. You got eight other spare embryos on the shelf. Let's use four more. Okay. So we'll do four more in the second attempt. What happened in the second attempt? Well, because the first attempt was uh, on average. In the second attempt, actually two implanted out of four. Actually here, it's actually three. <laughs> three implanted. This is a photograph, right? This is a sonograph. So three implanted, whoops. Oh no, but we only want one baby. All right, no problem. We do a selective reduction, selective reduction. In other words, you can choose which one of you want. And by the way, we can determine what sex they are. So you can, since you're gonna be choosing anyway, so choose, you want a boy, most couples want a first born son, etc. You can choose a girl, it's up to you. You can choose all three, but you decide because it's legal. So 
selective reduction. You know that euphemisms are used to minimize the impact. Mm -hmm. It means choose one baby and kill the others, but it's legal. So that's selective reduction. Well, we're not sure which one we want to keep. All right, so we can do quality control. Quality control, because it's a product, it's a thing, right? It's an object. And so we can do quality control. This is quality control can be done either before implantation or after implantation. Before implantation, yes, before implantation. Before implantation. But that, that, the, the, the pre-implantation genetics is more of a recent development versus yeah, the traditional, right. right. Versus what, the way it first started, clearly. Yes, exactly. So normal, uh, notice that this is PGD, not just PD. Pre-implantation diagnosis has been going on for decades already, all right, since the 80s or 90s. Uh, yeah, 80s, because mm -hmm. I was doing my first dissertation in Rome on this in the 90s. So prenatal diagnosis, right, is after, after implantation during the pregnancy. And the first level of prenatal diagnosis is just a sonogram mm -hmm. to see if the baby has a head, if the baby has two arms, et cetera, is what we call the gross morphology, G-R-O-S-S, -S, the gross morphology, to see if the baby is intact, right? And that's the first level. So most, uh, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, let me describe this first and then I'll go to the next slide. Pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, PGD. Pre-implantation means that they take the morula, yes, in the incubator and pull out one blastomere, which is one of the eight or 16 cells or 32 cells of the morula, one blastomere, right? And that blastomere has the intact human, human genome because each blastomere has the intact human genome. They send that one cell to the lab for genetic diagnosis, genetic test. The first thing they can do simply is do a karyotype. Karyotyping is just to see if this baby has 23 pairs of chromosomes, right? Get away. Come on. Oh, wait a minute. Come on. Okay, you want to do that? Go here. This is the simplest thing they can do, the karyotyping, right? Line them up like this to make sure that there's 23. By the way, uh, there was one that actually showed the cut up. Yeah, there, okay, this is a good one. So this is how they appear on the, the microscope. And then a technician has to print this on a sheet of paper and then cut them out and pair them up, right? To make this, because they're not gonna be like this in the inside the nucleus. <laughs> they're not gonna be paired up by one by one in order pairs from larger to smallest. They're gonna be like this, the chromosomes in the um, mitotic phase of division in prophase, right? And so they print this on a sheet of paper, large, and then the technician or an assistant gets the scissors and cuts them all out and then pairs them up by size, simply to see if we come up with 23 pairs, right? Is this a boy or a girl? Yeah, 20, the 23rd pair, they look pretty identical to me. So if it were X, Y, the Y is a little small like that. The Y is actually disappearing. <laughs> Don't get distracted. All right, so they take a blastomere, send it to the lab for genetic testing to see if it passes quality control, right? They can do some other tests. Now that there's an increasing number of abnormalities or potential abnormalities that are being detected in the genome, all right? In, in the genotype sequence. So if the sequence is, which is a more level of sophistication, they can see if they have proto-oncogenes or stuff like that, or predisposition for any kind of genetic abnormality or congenital disease. When, what do you think happens to the ones that don't pass quality control? Discard it. The morula, of course, they have to keep a tag to where it belongs, where that cell belongs to. So imagine all the documentation that has to be, they trace it back, oh, this one didn't pass quality control. So you get that morula and you toss it. Toss it, meaning either in the best case scenario, they'll put it in an orange uh, biohazard bag and 
then uh, some uh, outfit will come and pick it up and and um, and burn it right in an incinerator. That's what it's done with biohazard uh, parts, body parts in the in the uh, hospital when there's an amputation where there's uh, something uh, when there's human tissue uh, that has to be incinerated for health reasons so it doesn't contaminate other people, etc. So in the best case scenario, they do that, but that costs money. It's much simpler just to take that morla and toss it into the toilet because that doesn't cost anything. Because the couple has decided to discard it, it, he or she. All right, so that's pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, right? Uh, or it can be done after implantation, which is basically a selective reduction. You decide, uh, the couple decides, or the woman decides uh, which embryo they're gonna keep and which embryo they're not gonna keep, right? So that's, in other words, it's quality control. It's, it's a market economy. Now, I must say that uh, even with uh, traditional uh, PD, which is um, prenatal diagnosis, like a sonogram, the first level is just sonogram, right? If there's a gross abnormality. My first dissertation, the one in Rome on moral theology was precisely on prenatal diagnosis because it was a new technique that came out back in the 80s. And the Catholic Church had just approved it as long as it was not used to uh, have an abortion, okay? In other words, to see the health of the baby, to prepare for the couple to prepare. So what is the positive aspect of prenatal diagnosis? I'm not talking about PGD, I'm talking about after Im implantation. This would imply actually that was, uh, whether it was in vitro or not is irrelevant at that point because we already have an implantation. We already have a pregnancy, all right? Prenatal diagnosis, Sonogram, which is the first level, right? Non-invasive. What would justify a, a uh, prenatal diagnosis? Which by the way, today is standard for all, even just for legal reasons. Uh, an OBGYN who's following a pregnancy of a pregnant mom, if he or she doesn't do a sonogram, you know, within, I don't know when it is, the first one they do, first trimester, whatever, they're liable, they're suable. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, to see, yeah, that the pregnancy is uh, following health, yeah, that the embryo or fetus is growing healthily, right? Because precisely because abortion is legal, right? The woman has a right to know, has a legal right to know if the pregnancy is developing naturally or not, normally, if the embryo is healthy. So let's say that that first sonogram, one week, not, not one week, sorry. Two months, you have to be probably two months because um, by two months we have the little embryo that has all the body parts, the main body parts, but he or she is tiny, right? It's only about less than an inch long from head to rump, let's say. And so, but that can be visualized on the sonogram to see at least if he or she has a head and, and, and four limbs, two arms and two legs. And by the way, they'll see a little tail that will be receding, reabsorbed. Uh, so let's say that the little embryo is missing an arm. It's a congenital abnormality, something happened, did function correctly. So the little embryo is, but the rest of the embryo is developing normally. It looks normal, at least the gross abnormality, the gross anatomy, but he or she is missing an arm. Most prenatal diagnosis, most prenatal diagnosis comes back negative. What does negative mean? a negative diagnosis, that there was no abnormality detected for whatever they were, de for whatever they were detecting, or whatever they were checking, right? So negative result is good, no defects. About 95% of pre prenatal diagnosis comes back negative. That's a good thing. There's no abnormalities for whatever they were testing, all right? Of the more or less 5% that comes back positive, meaning some abnormality. The abnormality, any abnormality, I'm talking on sonogram, gross anatomy of the embryo, not that one, this one, right? The gross abnormality from the slightest to the most severe, what would be the most severe? The embryo is missing a head. The slightest could be the embryo is missing a finger, okay? All of them globally, of the 5% of 
prenatal diagnosis that comes back positive, over 95% of couples do what? Abort. Abort. Because most couples, most pregnant moms, they want a perfect child, right? And if it's legal, we're done. So you see the power, the two-edged sword of prenatal diagnosis. As long as it's not used for scheduling an abortion, but it's a risk. So what would be something that is justifiable? Well, like you were saying before, to prepare. To prepare. <clears throat> to and also, and uh, but even now, which back then was theoretical, did not exist. My first dissertation was in the, when was it? <laughs> in the, yeah, 1993, 93, in the early nineties, this was theory. The fetus as a medical patient. Mm -hmm. Now there's even a journal, fetal medicine and, and fetal surgery. Mm -hmm. Now can be done fetal surgery. I'm jumping to the last lecture. <laughs> Positive things about the beginning of human life. <laughs> All right, fetal medicine and fetal surgery. So the fetus as a medical patient. In other words, if they detect some abnormality, for example, hydrocephaly. Hydrocephaly is that the brain is too large with proportion to the body. Whoops, that's a problem. That embryo is accumulating or fetus is accumulating too much fluid, too much water in the brain. We got to drain that because then that fluid is going to compress against the brain and the brain will become a microbrain, microcephaly. So hydrocephaly <laughs> will cause the brain not to develop to its normal size. And they can do fetal surgery and put actually insert a little stint, a little tiny tube, imagine the size of that tube, all sterile to drain out the excess fluid that's accumulated to the head of the child until the child is born and then they'll do the rest of the repair once the baby is out of the womb, all right? That's an example of fetal surgery. Amazing. <laughs> so that's one example of a positive, uh, of a positive use of prenatal diagnosis. Hmm? Okay, we did that. We did that. So I've kind of been jumping the gun along the way in describing the biology and the clinical aspect of uh, IVF, but. Just to uh, mention one more time, in vivo, as opposed to in vitro, means in life within the body of the live uh, woman, right? That's what occurs naturally. So in vivo, contrast to in vitro, done in the lab. So essentially in vitro, what we have is the manufacturing of a human being in a lab. So these are considerations of practice aside to the considerations of principle, considerations of practice. Think about it. The risk of, hyper, of, of hyperovulation of the woman to her health and possible death, all right? That's one first risk. Then the collection, which is typically done by masturbation, which is the easiest thing. There's, a, there's an ethical way of collecting human sperm within the marital act, all right? There is an ethical way of doing it. It's essentially a perforated condom and so forth, but that's kind of cumbersome. And in, because again, think functionally, immediately after the intercourse, they have to rush that uh, condom, which is full of uh, semen inside and out to the lab to do all the processing, which is kind of cumbersome after having intimacy with, with the spouse, right? So uh, the easiest thing is just going to a bathroom and uh, produce a, uh, a semen sample, and then that's sent to the in vitro clinic, the in vitro lab, which by the way, now this allows for cataloging, so donor, donor sperm, right? And now uh, for the longest time, it was very difficult to crowd preserve eggs because of the large amount of cytoplasm that they have and therefore the large amount of volume of, of water that they have uh, internally. The problem with freezing water, what happens when we freeze water? Yes. Exactly. And so those ice crystals literally puncture and burst, they lice the egg, right? But now they figure out a way to freeze, to preserve the egg itself. So now you can also buy eggs on the catalog. <laughs> and the catalog has everything, the whole profile about the donor, except maybe their name and their address. 
it will have their age, their height, their gender, their, uh, uh, their ethnicity, their IQ, uh, if they were athletic or not. And, and companies are soliciting, especially eggs, because sperm comes cheaply, but especially eggs from young women who are in college, right? And they will pay you maybe five to $10,000 or maybe more for a, a single hyperovulation cycle. Mm -hmm. So you can sell your eggs, right? And if you have, so let's say for the standard um, uh, hyperovulation, they'll give you $10,000 and they'll extract whatever eggs were matured. If they're too mature, they'll extract that. If 40 mature, they'll extract that, all right? So one cycle, $10,000. Now, if you have a GPA of 3.5 or 3.8, maybe you get $20,000 because you have a higher IQ. And if you are also athletic on top of that, well, maybe you get $50,000 because now you're supposed to have good genes. You're more fit. <laughs> and it's a market. It's total market. And some women, sadly, some young women wipe out their student loans with one hyperovulation cycle. Okay? It's a risk. You find it in airplane. You find the... Uh, the uh, in airplanes, if I, you know, they're appealing to high level people, that you'll find the brochures and all that of clinics soliciting young women for uh, their eggs. Uh, so, <clears throat> of course, the abortions that are occurring, the failed implantations are abortions. Now, yeah, the failed implantations, on average, one implants, right? What happens to the other three? Discarded. That discarding. Well, professor, that's a natural abortion because they just didn't implant. They could have implanted. No one was prevented them from implanting. However, those three that are discarded are not natural abortions, ethically speaking. They are procured abortions. Why? Because at least a technician and the owner of the clinic knows that they are going on an average. They're hedging on the 25%. All right? And so they know, they may not have told the couple on average one implants, or not, you know, so the couple may or may not be guilty of that procured abortion, but that, that, in other words, those three discards would not have happened if the in vitro had not been done, you see? And therefore they're procured because they are part and package the consequence of doing the in vitro. It's part of the package. It's assuming that some of these are gonna be discarded beforehand and they still go through the procedure, okay? I'm a hunter. And I'm in the woods and I'm behind a bush and there's another bush there. And I hear rattling behind that other bush. Do I shoot or not shoot? What's behind the other bush that's rattling? It could be the deer that I'm looking for or it could be another hunter. And I better not shoot because otherwise if I rattle my bush, maybe that hunter shoots over here. So ethically, unless I'm certain that there's no other human being behind the bush. I may not shoot ethically. I can shoot, I will shoot if I, press the if I pull the trigger, but ethically I should not shoot until I'm certain that what's behind the bush is not another human being, okay? And so knowingly that these uh, abortions are gonna happen, then they're not natural. In the analysis, they're procured. So they have to be counted in, all right? The freezing and the thawing, again, is never 100% either. It's shotgun, and that's why they do the hyperovulation to begin with. Why don't they just go on a natural side? Why risk the health or the life of the mother with, an, with the hyperovulation? Why not just wait for a natural cycle and go after that one uh, follicle that has erupted? They're using sonogram anyway, so they can visualize the follicle, right? No, they need to start with excess because they know that along the way, many will be lost, all right? So this also has created the problem <laughs> of frozen human embryos. And over the decades now, because this has been going on for about 40 years now, remember Louis Brown, 1978, was the first test tube baby, UK, right? So uh, now we have millions just in the United States, it's estimated to be about 1 million frozen human embryos. What to do with the frozen human embryos? Couples to me come, any, talk to any priest. Has any couple 
asked you what to do with their frozen human embryos? <laughs> Most priests, if they've been a priest for more than a few months, they, they know of at least one couple that has asked them what to do. And what do you do? Those are human beings. You know, you're not going to implant a dozen embryos in the woman, right? Well, maybe you can, but that means a dozen years because each pregnancy is going to be nine months. <laughs> All right, so uh, what to do with frozen human embryos? And also this argument, which I don't see much out there, but to me, it makes a lot of sense. When we do IVF, we are denying that child natural selection, the right to natural selection. That may sound cruel at first. What do you mean? You want that embryo, you're pro-life and you want this embryo to be selected out by nature? Yes, I want that embryo to be selected out by nature if that embryo is not viable. In other words, let nature decide. I'm not killing the embryo, I'm allowing the embryo to die because the embryo is not viable. So that embryo has a right to natural selection. This process bypasses natural selection, but then they insert artificial selection, which is pre-implantation diagnosis or selective reduction. So they bypass natural selection, right? But then they insert artificial selection, selective reduction, right? But there, the big difference is that in natural selection, the embryo is dying on his or her own for any kind of, there's a, there's typically an, there is a non-viability. The non viable embryo is not gonna survive. That's what non-viability means, right? But in this case, it's not allowing the embryo to die, it's killing the embryo. It's a big difference. It's an extreme difference, <laughs> okay? And so yes, denying natural selection is an injustice. And it's an injustice not only to that individual, it's also an injustice to society when we extrapolate from there. You'll see what I mean in a minute. We need to do a little bit of analysis here. I realize having come to a break. Uh, you want a break or should we continue? Continue? If you need a break individually, go break. I'm gonna continue. I just need a bottle break. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you need a break individually, go ahead. Uh, let's... Um, Let's look a little bit, let's do a little ethical, philosophical analysis here, all right? Between the ends and the means. We need to look at the ends and the means. Because at the end of the day, what we're talking about is two different mentalities, two different mindsets of how to do ethics, how to do bioethics. We could do it either in a utilitarian way, or we can do it in a principled way, all right? And I can tell you that this program is doing ethics, bioethics in a principled way, not in a utilitarian way. What do we mean by that? So we have the end and the means to achieve the end. The end is having a baby. This couple wants to have a baby. That's the end. Is that a good end or a bad end? Well, in principle, it's a good end, no? They want to have a baby. What's wrong with having a baby? They're entitled to have a baby. Let's assume they're married and they want to love the baby. They want to give everything they can to the baby and so forth. So they want to have a baby. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, to marry in the Catholic church, the couple needs to want to have babies. <laughs> At least one or two, <laughs> the desire, unless there is some grave reason that is justified, okay? But in principle, the couple needs to want to desire having children. So the end is certainly a good end, laudable, never question the end of IVF as a good noble end. They're giving babies to people who can't have them and want them and can pay for them, etc. So, well, how about the means? You see, in utilitarian ethics, the mean doesn't really have to be justified or the mean is justified by the ends. But in principle ethics, the mean themselves have to be justified, okay? So that's the big difference. Let's look at it in more detail. Do the ends justify the means? So that's a question. We say, why, why should the means, why can the end not justify the means that are used? Well, utilitarian, they say, yes, the end justifies the means. It's a normal end, so whatever means to get there, what's wrong with that? In principle, bioethics will say, no, the means also have to be justified ethically. They have to be correct, proper, ethical, right? So let's follow the utilitarian argument. 
Of course, they're not saying break the law, all right? So if I need money to pay for my uh, loans, I could steal the money because paying the loan is a good thing. The end is to pay the loan. I need to pay the loan. I want to pay the loan. I don't want to go to prison, all right? So I need money to pay the loan. I don't have the money. Well, I can steal the money. So that's not what utilitarians are saying because stealing the money is illegal. So they're saying, don't break the law. Don't break the law. But you see, I'm not stealing the money, not because stealing is unethical, but because by stealing, I could go to prison. In other words, I'm not stealing, not because it's unethical. I'm not stealing because if I steal, I could go to prison. So I'm not stealing because I don't wanna to go to prison, not because I don't wanna steal. Okay, so it's a big difference. The utilities will say, well, as long as it's illegal, then it's justified. It's a big problem with this kind of uh, reasoning. And the problem is this. Well, before I show you the, the, the fault in this argument, you notice that in vitro is driven essentially by a market economy, okay? To the tunes, really billions of dollars. And so, the industry now can provide a baby to those couple who can have it. What's wrong with that? They can pay. They can pay for the product and the service. And we, the clinic, can provide the product. What's wrong with that? We have the highest standards of control to produce the best baby possible. And in fact, the industry, these are all photos from the internet. All the photos are going to be, you know, baby pink and baby blue. But of course, none of this describes what is really going on behind the scenes, okay? And by the way, the industry doesn't really care and pass judgment because this would imply this baby is held by the mom's hands and by the dad's hands, right? Well, but that's what we're projecting there. You could put another set of hands here, but this could be a male hand and another male hand. Well, this could be two female uh, sets of hands, right? Or you could put a third set of hands here which could have been the donor or the surrogate mother who is carrying the pregnancy and so on and so forth. Uh, the, the, the industry is not gonna pass judgment on any of that because they're not there to judge the couple. They're just there to deliver the product, <laughs> okay? And so the facade, you know, it's all about happy babies, right? And happy couples and, uh, but it's also a boutique industry because this is so far not covered by insurance. And so it's basically out of pocket. Well, let's look at this utilitarian argument that the means justify the ends as long as it's not illegal. What happens is the legality of it make this a legalistic type of judgment. For example, the law establishes the minimal consensus for society to live civilly, right? So do not steal because we have a right to private property and banks have a right to keep the bank, the money of other people and so on and so forth. And do not kill because I have a right to maintain my own life and so forth. But the law is minimal. The law cannot be maximal because if the law is maximal, it covers too many aspects of human life. For example, Adultery. I hope that as responsible adults, uh, we all agree that adultery is not a good thing, right? It's a bad thing. If it happens to oneself, one would be very hurt by that. Adultery, any normal human being, I mean normal adult, I would think, says that adultery is not a good thing, ethically. Now, when was the last time you saw someone getting arrested for adultery? It doesn't happen. And it can happen because what are you going to do? You put cameras in bedrooms and you're going to ask the couple before the intercourse to show their marital status and show the, the marriage license. So it's not enforceable, right? If we were to legalize, in fact, in many states or some states anyway, in some states, adultery is still in the books, in the legal books. <laughs> it's, it's illegal, but it costs more money. It's not enforced. You know, it's a law that is not enforced, but it's, it's in the law books. Some lawyers have told me this. 
but it costs more money to pull that old law out of the legal books than to just not enforce it, period. It's not enforced, okay? And all of us who know, who drive through traffic of Miami, we know that there are many traffic laws that are not being enforced, right? Like for example, excess driving or, or driving above the speed limit. It happens, most of the times we get away with it. But the law, if the law were to cover every ethical aspect of humanity, it would be impossible to live. It would be a totalitarian state. They would regulate, would have cameras everywhere and would be stopped every few minutes asking us, why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? We're breaking laws left and right. So the law has to be just minimal for maintaining civility. And that's a good positive law, all right? Civil law. So we cannot use law as, the moral standard. The moral standard has to be above and beyond the law, right? In other words, I don't steal not because it's illegal, but because it's unethical. It's not my money, it's not my property, it's somebody else's. So utilitarianism ends up one way or another manipulating people, all right? And at the end of the day, it's basically a shouting match. Whoever is the strongest uh, in whatever way is the one who rules. And it's not a very conducive, civilized way to live. So the alternative is to do principle bioethics. In other words, develop a responsible, mature conscience, which is really what this program is trying to do in the different aspects of human life and the environment, and then act responsibly, right? With knowledge. In fact, you take conscience, cum ciencia, is with knowledge. Hmm? And if you have a Hispanic background and you know, cum ciencia, right? with knowledge. We inform our conscience and then we act. It does take time. And that's what is to become an adult. So we develop a conscience that is responsible and so forth, and then we can act for the good, right? And therefore the means also need to be justified. And the means that are used, frankly, are very offensive in IVF, minimally to the woman, but also to the couple, and to society at large. And so society at large because of this aspect. When I deny natural selection to the child, that child is not necessarily the best possible child that that child could be, or the best possible human, naturally speaking. Remember that what is the spontaneous rate of abortion of the human species? Anyone remember that from? covered it earlier, I think, maybe it was in the, should have been in the previous uh, lecture video, about 50% natural pregnancy loss, natural. I'm saying that about half of human pregnancies never make it to term, naturally. So we have one of the highest rate of spontaneous abortion in nature that we know of, okay? Now, what's your intuition? Most of those abortions occur when? in the nine months. At the very beginning. Early on. First, second week, around implantation precisely, around implantation. And the whole thing is precisely that little blastocyst did not convince the uterus, the endometrium, that it was friend and not foe. And the uterus says, uh-uh, you're out. Or the embryo himself or herself got out because of some kind of abnormality, all right? And so this is very sophisticated biochemical stuff interaction that is going on during, especially those first two weeks and even doing gastrulation and everything else. Imagine everything has to be so orderly developed. That's why we have the developmental genes, right? The ones, the first genes that kick in that allow for everything else to develop properly, okay? And so it's a super sophisticated biochemistry that is occurring and we just don't have that kind of sophistication in an in vitro lab. And so the selection that occurs naturally on the human species is a good thing because it means that on average, most of us who make it to birth are the best possible result of that pregnancy of our parents nine months prior. Otherwise, we would have been aborted along the way because we didn't meet nature's quality control where there is no guilt because you know, unless the mom was totally irresponsible, I, I say this, unless the mom was totally irresponsible about her pregnancy and she went horseback riding on her seventh month, you know, galloping for three hours, 
that could possibly induce an abortion, right? <laughs> or a miscarriage. But if she was responsible for her pregnancy and still lost the pregnancy, there's absolutely no guilt. It means that on average, most likely that the low emperor fetus had some kind of abnormality that was incompatible with life. We call it non-viable, all right? And so that's really a good thing because then on average, those of us who are, are alive and around are the best possible result of that pregnancy or that fertilization of our parents. And therefore, that's a good thing for society, <laughs> all right? When we deny that, we're also doing an injustice to society at large. <laughs> Excuse me, not to mention <clears throat> when these in vitro children start marrying 20, 30 years later, right? And especially with donor parents, with donor banks of sperm and egg, how do I know that the woman I fall in love with as a, as a young adult is not my half sister? because she came from the same father, donor, sperm that I did. She has a different mom, but maybe she has the same dad as I do. And again, most in vitro babies do not know it. Don't know they're in vitro because parents are not gonna say this. That's a hush hush secret that they're gonna keep, you know, they're gonna tell the child, oh, you were manufactured in the lab. <laughs> no. There are lots of these like a single donor to make ceremony because their parents want to do maybe studies happen before. And yeah, that's exactly. It. You played for, and it's horrific. And how come? So, 30 years later, this they, they can't marry, etc., etc. And our children are normal. Yeah, because you're related, you have brothers and sisters. Just not a week goes by, right? You remember anything from this program? Yeah, they always said not a week goes by. Okay, so just last week in BBC <laughs> online, I saw there was one article there, one headline. Uh, in Europe, they told one guy, stop it, because you're the father of over 400 I children. I remember that. Right? Yeah. You know, and these 400, they have a chance of meeting at some point and falling in love. <laughs> and they don't know it. So you see, and the law told them now we... You say the laws, it's hard to enforce that law. <laughs> yes, and it does happen, especially for men. Yeah, if the if the sperm is very potent, you know, if they have very competent sperm that just practically fertilizes any egg inside, that sperm is high value sperm on the market. <laughs> it's just high value sperm. Okay. And so when these guys find out, what's it to them? It's nothing to them except for masturbation to get a lot of money for the sperm. And so it's happening. And these are the issues that come up. These are the issues that come up. So this industry, with all due respect, I know it's producing babies for couples who can't have them, but that's in the best case scenario. It's also interfering a lot in natural social life. Okay, and it's increasing. It's increasing. The two doctors who invented this uh, technique, doctors Edward and Steptoe, right? The ones who manufactured Louise Brown in, in 1978, and she was born in 79, over in the UK a few years ago, they got the Nobel Prize in medicine for inventing this technique, which is the highest standard of you know, achievement for many, and, but they had to wait really about 30 years. Why? Proof of principle. So they invented in vitro after many trials. I don't remember how many trials were done, but Louise was finally born and so forth. Was that enough that Louise was born as a normal baby, no known abnormalities, and she started growing as a child, little girl, teenager, etc. When was the principle proved? What principle? The principle that in vitro fertilization works, can be done in the human. I mean, IVF had been done in, in animals before, right? But IVF done in the human can work. That's the proof of principle. What did they have to wait to happen to Louise Brown in her life to prove the principle? Oh, for her to have children? For her to have children to see if she was fertile or not. 
And they're not going to tell Louise Brown, okay, now would you please have some sex so, see, so we can see if you're fertile or not, right? They have to wait for the natural thing, for the lady to fall in love and to have children if she wanted children, et cetera. And so when she finally had children, that is when it proved the principle 20 or 30 years later, I don't know when she married and she did have their children and so forth. So a big success, again, a lot of balloons because yes, that finally proved the principle that in vitro fertilization can work. But in the meantime, it was out in the market with the caveat that we don't know, it's still an experimental procedure, but I need 20 to $40,000 to do it, okay? So, this is the process. Uh, oh yeah, selective pressure is just again to review this thing of natural selection. The selective pressure, there are two, at least two levels of selective pressure against the human specifically, right? And it may be comparable with many other mammals. I really don't know exactly, but at least I know clinically for human semen, a human ejaculate to be considered potent. In other words, capable of fertilizing needs to have quantitatively how many sperm within that ejaculate. Millions. About 100 to 150 million. That's the standard clinical competency, right? So for, it can be less than that, but it loses, it's not 100% competency. To be, to, for a man to be considered capable of fertilizing, fully competent, it has to be between 100 and 150 million. So that means, and it's only fertilizing one egg, right? So the selective pressure against human fertilization is at least 100 million to one, 100 million to one, which is astronomical selective pressure against fertilization, okay? In fact, and that's why the window of fertilization opportunity, this is gonna come up again when we look at NFP. What's the window of fertilization for, for the human in days? Isn't it like after 70, ovulation. Isn't it like 72 hours or something like that? Well, normally it's about between 24 hours. It's estimated that the shortest time is about 10 minutes after ejaculation, 10 minutes for the sperm to get up there. But the outsides, that's the minimal window and the maximum is about five days. So, so wait, wait, restate the question again? Then? Yes. I'm what is the window of fertilization in days for the human, for human woman, right? So the window is about five days. In other words, the couple could have had sex on day one and she ovulated on day five. She could still get pregnant from that intercourse five days prior. <laughs> because in other words, sperm, the egg normally only lasts 24 hours. Right. And then it becomes all ripened and is discarded, no fertilization, menstruation. The sperm on average, within the epididymis and the vas deferens and all the tubes of seven inflow vesicles is about 24 hours. <laughs> but new sperm is being produced all the time. All sperm dies, generates, and is reabsorbed by the tissue. We don't blow up the sperm. It's reabsorbed by the tissue and new sperm is produced every 24 hours, okay? Ejaculation happens, but that sperm in the tubes only lasts within 24 hours, but in the female tract, it lasts about five days. In other words, it's kept nourished. It's kept nourished and alive for up to five days, okay? And so one has to estimate that five-day possibility when looking at NFP, because, oh no, we had intercourse four days ago. I'm not ovulating until uh, tomorrow. Careful, because some sperm may still be around and you only need one <laughs> that is up at the fallopian tube just waiting at the aquila <laughs> at that point. Okay, so anyway, that's the, uh, that's the process there. Selective pressure, 100 million to one for fertilization. And then at implantation, why is the ratio two to one? Selective pressure against implantation two to one. What are the options? The blastocyst either implants or not, right? So that's a 50-50 chance. So there's a second selection, and that's a pretty strong chance, you know. If um, let's say that I'm, uh, I always use traffic. <laughs> I'm coming to the street and I see a red light. It's at night, and all the cars have their lights off. I'm just setting up the problem. <laughs> okay, it's at night. All the cars have their lights off. Uh, there's a red light, and I take the chance of taking the red light. 
it's a 50-50 chance that I get hit or not, <laughs> right? Would you take a chance? I wouldn't take that chance. I would not risk a 50-50 chance of dead or alive. It's ridiculous. And yet that's a real uh, selective pressure at implantation. So implantation, I'm just saying that implantation is another huge event. It better happen, otherwise there's no next generation. So all this is bypassed. Well, this one, no, but it's reduced to 25%. And it's done so artificially. Anyway, the very end, very 30. I'm gonna need about 10 more minutes, okay? So here we go. Uh, so bioethically, the conclusion obviously is uh, what is happening here is just a gross manipulation of human life, all right? All for the best intentions for sure. But the means, the means really need to be justified because we're talking about human life, you know? You know we're not buying some ketchup on the shelf or something like that where we can have choice. Here, we're talking about human life. So consistent with the argument that a zygote is a human being, then we have to be consequential about that. Mm -hmm. uh, further manipulations, surrogate motherhood, right? So now, you, just like you can buy egg and sperm, you can also rent a womb, rent a womb. Uh, so <clears throat> who's the biological mother? Well, it's a biological mother genomically, but there is a biological mother gestationally, okay? And we know that a lot of bonding happens during the pregnancy, a lot of interaction. The fetus ends up with mother cells. The mother ends up with fetal cells, you know, after birth and so on and so forth. And that all that has very sophisticated implications, typically on the immune system of the baby and the mother, et cetera, et cetera, all for the good when the gestational mother is the same as the uh, fertilization mother, and all that is bypassed with a surrogate mother. Surrogate mother meaning someone else is carrying the pregnancy, all right, some other woman. In addition to the exploitation that occurs, that may occur with this surrogate motherhood, which is, of course, the surrogate mother is not doing this for free. She may do it for free. Sometimes there's a grandmother who did it for her daughter uh, because the mother couldn't carry the pregnancy. So the grandmother carried the pregnancy of her daughter, which would be the mother of the child inside the grandmother's womb, okay? Yes, it was in the news. Uh, but then, and that was done for free, for sure, because they kept it in the family. But the other scenario is that they pay the surrogate mother for carrying the pregnancy for nine months. Several thousand dollars if it's here, but it will be several hundred dollars if it's in Latin America or Asia or Africa, or, or other parts of the world, which are typically developing countries where they have poor women, poor young women who are otherwise healthy, but they have little or no money. Later, you can go to this website. Okay, what happened here was that a uh, <clears throat> Australian couple who couldn't have children did IVF, but the lady for whatever reason didn't want to carry the pregnancy. So they sent two embryos to Singapore to a young lady who was selling gum or candy in the streets or something like that. And they pay her several thousand dollars, right? But they sent, or maybe they sent four, I don't know, but she ended up with two pregnancies. She was carrying two pregnancies, all right? And then when uh, some uh, chromosomal analysis was done on the pregnancy, it turns out one of the pregnancy, oh no, they did, they did a karyotyping, but, after implantations, if you already had the pregnancy, you did a karyotype afterwards in the prenatal diagnosis, one of the results came back with Down syndrome. So the couple, the Australian couple who's paying for this said, please discard, do selective reduction. In other words, get rid of the Down syndrome child, we only want the normal child. And the Singapore, Singapore lady said, no way, I'm not having an abortion. I'll carry the, the child, but I'm not having an abortion. And by the way, I'm suing you for several million dollars because now I have to maintain this Down syndrome child for the rest of his or her life. And you're the cause of it. And it was a huge thing. The pregnant lady won the suit. She kept both, both uh, well, when the two babies were born, the normal baby went to the Australian 
a couple. And she kept the Down syndrome child with the several million dollars that she got from the uh, lawsuit. And uh, what else? And then it became an international scandal because it turns out that these embryos were sent from Australia to Singapore. And technically, that is human trafficking. <laughs> so you can see, it was, and there it is. Okay, hi. Oh, I'm sorry. It was not Singapore, it was Thailand. Yes, she was from Thailand, the young lady. So we can see it in Latin America. We can see it in many places occurring. It just leads itself to that kind of thing. All right, the exploitation of um, young women uh, for money. Not to mention, Who's, who is my mother? The fertilization mother or the gestation mother, right? Again, maybe babies will not know because they will not be told. Uh, one possibility, what to do with the frozen embryos? One possibility would be to rescue the embryo to adopt the embryo. <laughs> now we have adoption of babies, right? And baby adoption. But uh, do we find babies for adoption? Why do people do in vitro? Some couples in the US do in vitro because they just can't find a baby to adopt in the US. They can't find a baby because most babies that are not wanted are aborted, not given for adoption or the babies that are available for adoption are either, very frankly, of the wrong ethnicity or they're crack babies, you know, they come with some abnormality or they come with some addiction from the mom, et cetera. So that the babies that are more available for adoption in the United States because the normal babies were from unwanted pregnancies and are no longer living. So it's difficult to adopt babies in the US for most of the population. So they go elsewhere. They go to Ukraine a lot because they look a lot like us. <laughs> okay, they're Caucasian. Uh, but one possibility would be to adopt a, a, an embryo, to adopt a blastocyst, cryopreserved in the tanks, in the fertility tanks, the spare embryo. In other words, to adopt the spare embryo. It has to be done legally, and it may be justified ethically if we have some conditions, right? Uh, this, by the way, is the uh, document, Dignitas Personae. This is the website for the uh, Vatican Library, where this document is available. The Vatican Library has many, many documents of the Catholic Church. You can download them for free in whatever language you want. And so this is one. This is the second document that has come out of the in vitro. This came out in the 2000s. Oh, yeah, 2008. Here it is, 2008. Uh, but there's a previous one that came out in 1987, I think it is, yeah, Donum Vitae, Donum Vitae on the gift of life. That was the first Vatican document that came out uh, almost 10 years, about eight years after uh, Louis Brown, uh, saying no to in vitro, basically. But it took us eight years to do the analysis and to come to the conclusion, with all due respect, this is not good, should be avoided. But it was already eight years in, so by that time, just like a council session, it has spread throughout the world. Anyway, uh, the first document that I'm talking about, this one, uh, Donum Vitae, on the Gift of Life of 1987, did not talk about embryo adoption because it was not a possibility yet then. Since then, this possibility has arisen, which is the possibility of adopting a human embryo, a cryopreserved blastocyst, okay? Adopting him or her, all right? And the second document, which now addresses this case, is called Dignitas Personae, on the dignity of the human person. All right, and that's the site where you can look at it and download it. But basically, I'll give you the crunch, which is this. It's an open question. If the Catholic Church has not made a, an official pronunciation, an official pronouncement on an issue, like for example, when the Catholic Church said in vitro fertilization itself is wrong, or contraception itself is wrong, okay, or euthanasia is wrong. That's already a doctrinal, or it's not doctrinal, but it's a moral 
uh, statement, then it's no longer up for discussion, at least within the Catholic teaching. It's no longer for discussion. We say, in Latin, we say, Roma locuta causa finita, all right? Roma locuta means if, the, if Rome and the Vatican speaks, then the cause is finished, it's no longer up for discussion. However, in Dignitatis Personae, in this document, which is the latest one to date on this issue of the possibility of adopting a human blastocyst, it leaves it as a question mark. It says, we don't see how this could possibly be done, but at least the document doesn't say outright it should not be done. And therefore it leaves a window. And when it leaves a window, it's called questionis disputate. It is still discussed, it's been disputed, all right? And so then we revert back to Catholic world theology, and there's a case that is called probabilism. It's getting a little technical. I know, guys, let me put that word in here just for, uh, I haven't gotten there yet. Uh, let me find the page. Do I have, yeah, there we go. Okay, I'm just going to put it in here, which is the summary. Don't worry about it. You have the your own summary. Uh, probabilism. Now, probabilism goes back several centuries in the Catholic Church, in other contexts, but basically probabilism means, can you see it there? Hopefully, that's big enough. It means that when there are equal probabilities, equal probability of two outcomes, and the church has not officially declared itself yet, either way, then either way is acceptable. All right, either way is acceptable. So what are the two probabilities? The two probabilities of embryo adoption, of adoption plus is that yes, it is ethical. No, it is not ethical. Those are the two probabilities, right? Okay, so how can we make a case for yes, adopting a human blastocyst? Well, this is my ethical analysis, all right, as a theologian. And um, I also sent you a little article on IVF that I, um, uh, posted that I wrote and published about, uh, I think it was 2007, something like that. And it's part of the package of the attachments that I sent. All right, it's an article on in vitro. Uh, so this is the possibility for adopting human embryos. What are natural rights? What are natural rights of all people? We have a natural right. Natural rights are before positive rights. Positive rights are the legal rights, okay, of society. But natural rights, I have a natural right to breathe. <laughs> because it keeps me alive. I have a natural right to eat and sleep, etc. I have a natural right to have a father and a mother who generated me biologically, who gave me their genome, okay? Because that's how it happens in nature. So I have a natural right to a father and a mother. And in fact, I have a natural right to be not just gestated, not just fertilized, created by my mom and my dad, I also have a natural right to be gestated by my mom, by, 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 by my biological mother for nine months, right? Unless there's some clinical issue that uh, justifies a premature delivery or something like that. But these are natural rights. So I have a natural right to be gestated by my biological mother. Further, once I'm born, I also have a natural right to be raised by my biological father and my biological mother. I know I'm getting into a minefield, into ethical territory, but very respectfully, we all have natural rights to our biological parents raising us because it's not just about producing a baby and then leaving the baby on the sidewalk, right? In other words, if the couple wants a baby, it's to raise the baby, not just to produce a baby and then leave them there. Okay, now we, we had a baby. Okay, now bye-bye. No, it's to raise the child, to love the child, raise the child, give the child all that the child needs to become another adult. And so that involves, let's see, maybe 20 years, 18, 20 years, 25 years, you know, when do you kick the kid out of the house? Well, if you're Hispanic, it's gonna be 40 or 50 years because unless that kid marries, they're not leaving the house because <laughs> they got free room on board. <laughs> anyway, what I'm trying to say is that parent, children have a natural right to be raised by their parents and to ra be raised correctly and properly and so forth, all right? These are natural rights. It doesn't always happen. But the fact that it doesn't always happen doesn't mean that we have to discard it. No, we have to strive for it the more when it doesn't happen, okay? And many times we see social institutions that are trying to supply for that. So what happens to babies when 
there's abuse at home. Children and families come in, uh, the Department of Children and Family, and they take that kid out of the home because there's violence in the home. And they put the kid in a foster home. It's not their natural parents, but they're trying to protect the life of the child, the health of the child. Or they find foster parents because the natural parents couldn't cut it. So they find foster parents. So these institutions are tr trying to do what is best. All right. Well, how about adopting these embryos? How about adopting these blastocysts? In my analysis, under probabilism, I say yes, as long as two conditions. First, the embryo is going to be adopted by a couple of one man and one woman who is legally married and who is ethically married, you know, who, who are married validly, we say validly, right? So a couple, in other words, not a single mom, not a homosexual couple, but a couple of a man and a woman because I have a right to a father and a mother to raise me, all right? So uh, that's the first condition. And the second condition, how many, so one, we have to deal with implantation at one point, right? We have to deal with implantation. All right, so how many should we implant? One at a time. Why? Because that's what happens in nature. One at a time. Normal, right? Again, I'm using norm. I'm not using extraordinary. I know that people naturally can have triplets and quintuplets. I think, what was the, the maximum? What was the, uh, was it seven? Nine, Nine was the, the record so far. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> she's wider than she's tall. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, they're all previous, right? Anyway, uh, so one at a time, because I cannot expose that blastocyst. I cannot expose this blastocyst. I can, but I may not. I should not expose this blastocyst to a risk greater than the natural risk. And the natural risk of not implanting is 50-50, all right? So I may not hedge it. I not, not implant two or three at a time, attempted implantations, because then I'm reducing the percentage of, of possibility of implantation. Is this more commonplace now or? <clears throat> it's becoming it's... a little bit to the point that not in the Catholic Church, but our Protestants, some of our Protestant brothers and sisters figure it out and they are now running snowflake babies. So you can punch in snowflake babies and they have a website and they will do the stuff. You know, they will uh, meet with a couple. There's a lot of counseling that needs to be done and so forth. And then they will also meet with the other couple whoever is donating the embryo, this has to be truly donated. Now there's gonna be money involved because there's a lot of techniques that have to be paid for. But the embryo himself or herself has to be donated because we're not gonna sell that embryo. We're not gonna buy that embryo, okay? So it's different, that kind of donation of a human blastocyst to the adoptive couple is very different. It's radically different from the donation that the IVF clinic does with spare embryos when they donate them to a research lab for obtaining their stem cells. Because in that case, that embryo is being donated to be destroyed, to be killed. For but, the in stem vitro, cells. but the in vitro facility is going to make money regardless. Because they are. Yeah. Because they have to be paid for the techniques. Yeah. And they have to be paid for the done for the done techniques of the crop preservation yeah. and all that. So who goes to the bank no matter what? The clinic. The clinic. And that's why it's a multi-billion dollar industry. They go to the bank no matter what, right? And it's legal. So this is a possibility for rescuing, but we don't want to call it rescue. You know, it's really an adoption, but it's an embryo adoption. And why? Because technology allows it now. Technology does allow it, but you know, at least some provisions have to be in place because that wow. embryo is really a human being who will grow. And at some point that human being may know that he or she belonged to a biological couple who for whatever reason couldn't because they had others, et cetera. At some point that child could be explained when they grow up, the whole thing. And their adoptive parents are the ones who raised them. 
Would you say the two presentations that the girls moments, you know, we have selected from like a single ovulation and then just a single plastic one that it's normal? Right. Okay. You notice, very good question. You notice that um, I said here um, considerations of practice, right? Let me go to that slide for a moment. Yeah. Considerations of practice of why uh, is unethical. In addition to considerations of practice, all right, there's also considerations of principle of why it's unethical. And the why it's unethical on principle is this one. It turns out that we also have a right to be fertilized, to be generated at the ampulla. Because that's where it occurs naturally. We have a right, we have a natural right to be created by our mom and our dad at the ampulla of our mom. Because that's the best place where we can be created. Anywhere other than that is a higher risk of death or abnormality. And I just don't have a right to risk the life of the embryo beyond the natural risk of nature. And in nature, this is where it happens. So I have a natural, we all have a natural right to be created biological by our parents and given a soul by God here and only here. And that's the contrast precisely. That's why that's the reason for this slide, in vitro, in vivo. So the fertilization itself is happening extracorporeally. And that's an injustice. Some people may not see it, but if you think about it long enough, it's not right, it's not correct. It's an injustice to bypass this very process because this is, the best possible process for having a healthy baby nine months later, okay? And it doesn't lend itself to what happens here because this is gonna be, it's gonna it has to go into a market economy thing of quality control. There's everything, uh, the soda that we drink and this pen has gone through quality control to toss out the ones that didn't work. Now, that argument also segues into AI, which I'll do very fast. <laughs> it's a long 10 minutes, I know it's a long 10 minutes. Because AI, which is the other AI, not the new AI of artificial intelligence, artificial insemination, different. And this is what happens. Artificial insemination, but the insemination, but the fertilization, what kind of fertilization is this? It's inter, I mean. In vivo. Yeah. This is in vivo fertilization. What I'm doing here, basically, I'm essentially introducing sperm into the female reproductive tract so that then sperm from there can do its thing and reach the egg or not and fertilize or not. But the egg will be fertilized in the ampulla. All right? So I'm assisting <clears throat> the sperm to get to its location. But I'm not substituting. And that is, this is crucial, bioethically speaking, between assisting in artificial insemination or substituting a vital process. Now, not all processes are vital in metabolism, but fertilization is certainly a vital process, right? <laughs> because it's generating a new life, so it's a vital process. We don't have a right to substitute vital processes. We may assist vital processes or not, but to substitute, we don't have a right to be substituting a functioning heart, a natural heart for an artificial heart. If the heart is functioning naturally, normally, I don't have a right to exact, I'll tell you a case. <laughs> I actually had this case. All right. When I was at FIU, I had a girlfriend. <laughs> and the girlfriend, uh, obviously, eventually we broke up, right? But the girlfriend ended up in New York. She eventually ended up marrying, had a child. And years later, she calls me out of the blue. And at that point, she knew that I had become a priest and everything else and a theologian. And uh, so she calls me and says, Alfred, I have a question for you. Because it turns out my child, who is now a teenager, uh, has um, 
is it myocarditis, pericarditis? His the child's heart was larger than normal for a teenager. So the body's still growing as a teenager, right? But the, the teenage heart was larger than uh, normal. And it's a risk condition, it's a risky condition, all right? Especially when the body's still growing as a teenager, right? That heart cannot be too large. It's a risky condition. Uh, and it could even involve death in, in extreme cases. Now, she told me, I already, I'm an adult, all right? Uh, so this condition of an enlarged heart is much more risky for a teenager than for an adult, okay? Because the adult, essentially the body has finished growing in size, all right? And so a larger heart is not that risky. So it says, I want to exchange hearts with my son. It made a lot of sense, <laughs> have a double transplant. She wants to give her heart to her child, you know, but of course she's getting her heart's child <laughs> in exchange. She's not staying heartless, <laughs> literally. It says, wow, Judy, <laughs> that's very interesting. <laughs> I don't know it was my first answer, but I'll certainly look it up and find out. So I spoke with a fellow uh, um, bioethicist, another priest who I know and so forth, and we talked about it. He says, well, look, it's very interesting, it's very noble. It, you could think that possibly could you justify it because it's a vital organ swap, right? But first of all, no surgeon is gonna do that surgery, period. <laughs> Absolutely, they are suitable from here to eternity if they do that kind of surgery. You're taking out, think of the case of the mother, you're taking out a, a normal heart, you know, and substituting a heart that is not fully normal, that is an enlarged heart, even though it's lower risk on, on but you're putting a normal patient into higher risk with a transplant. That's the first principle of, of organ transplants. You don't put the donor into higher risk, okay? And so, no, uh, even though it would, potentially save the life of the child or the teenager because of the high risk of the enlarged heart in the teenager, okay? So no, it cannot be done. It should not be done ethically, all right? But uh, so why, why will we say, okay. So it's kind of analogous in the sense that that was a vital process also. The heart is a vital process, right? Functionally speaking. And so you don't have a right to substitute vital processes. We can assist them but not substitute them, okay? Precisely because the difference is between life and death. So that's why AI could be justified, artificial insemination, because it's assisting fertilization, excuse me, but it's not substituting the fertilization process in locus, in place, where it actually happens naturally, all right? Okay, folks, that is it really. I apologize again for the extra half hour. Uh, a lot of material, some things to think about, all right, and do. And there's no problem. Bring it back next week if you want. Uh, if you have thoughts, comments, questions, or disagreements, bring them up, please, because this is the process, right? This is why we are in a... Uh, learning, teaching, learning situation, because we can ask questions and try to figure out the, what is proper. That's bioethics. We have to do the ethical analysis. And by the way, so you notice that one is one of the tendency of students, especially when they're doing the summaries, is that uh, they'll do the summary in greater detail on the biological part because it's easier, it's factual. But then when it gets to the ethical analysis, you're tiptoeing here and there because you don't want to step on the tulips or, or crush the eggshells. But no, you, you got to do the ethical analysis also. So if you're going to be in detail, do more detail on the ethical analysis than on the biology, because we all agree basically on the biology, we, we agree if we are realistic, all right? So if you're going to do detail, don't waste your detail on the biology, apply it on the ethical analysis, which is really the harder thing, but this is what it's all about. This is what the, the course is about. It's on the ethical analysis of the beginning of human life. Okay, thank you very much. You've been very patient. 
And then that's it. Uh, we'll meet up again next uh, Saturday, 9.30. Wait, 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 it's next Saturday. Oh, next Saturday, again, you get my virtual self. <laughs> wow. I think so. You got to see this. Hold on. Okay. okay. Give me, give me a bit. Let me explain okay. this. Don't go. I have stuff for you. Okay. Rana, Mara, Diana, wait. Okay, Joe. Yeah, I guess that's yours. Joe and Sarah. Yeah. Right? Uh, Kenny's sick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's, um, You're allowed to take his stuff to him? Um, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I don't know, but. I, if you don't know, then we have to. It's a. It's a. I don't. We don't live with each other anyway, so. I know. I know. Yeah. It's a. Friend, it's, it's a great thing. Mm -hmm. Not supposed to know each other's great. So. Anyway, I can ask it going forward. Go to the future. What I wanted to say about next week is I have a meeting. Up, there's a conference of uh, Society of Catholic Scientists that I'm going with my brother up in Newark. So I will be here next Saturday again. Sorry about that. It just coincided. But uh, so you'll get the video again, all right? So no for next, next weekend. No class here next weekend. It's the same as last weekend. You get the video and the materials. So you do that uh, virtually, all right? Two weeks, we're back. And by that, two weeks is June 10. Yeah, June 10, we're back here, okay? Thank you very much. Thanks again. Safe travels. All right. Thank you, you too. Joe, you had something? I'm sorry. Okay, but let me let me close this. Uh, let me stop. Uh, Kendall, Michael, thank you very much. Okay.